morning. Thank you very, very much for joining us here today. My name is Linda Levy Grossman. I am the president of Theatre Washington. And the reason why I am here today is because about two years ago, uh, Clay Lord from Theatre Bay Area and Brad Erickson reached out to me to share an idea that they had and that they were working on with Alan Brown and others about new ways to measure audience engagement and something that would be fairly revolutionary. And they invited Washington to be a part of this national study. At this time, uh, our Theater Washington cake was still baking in the oven. And uh, our organizational evolution from the Helen Hayes Awards to Theater Washington was underway. And we knew immediately that this was a key project and something that we very much wanted to be involved with, especially as we were forming our new identity as well. Um, I very much look forward, uh, on behalf of, of my colleagues at Theatre Washington, to working with you as we go forward after today, um, after we learn and understand this um, exceptional, learn about more about this exceptional study, and how we, as a theatre community, can work together to implement it, to understand it, and to really impact our audiences and to impact our community. Um, as I said, this uh, idea uh, was, uh, came from our friends at Theatre Bay Area, um, our sister service organization who not only uh, represent their own constituency in San Francisco, but um, have become a major force in, in, in advancing our profession nationally. I have enormous admiration for them. I have enormous gratitude for them for what they are doing on behalf of all of us in professional theater. I especially want to thank, obviously, Arena Stage for opening their wonderful cradle to us today, and very much to Clay Lord, who is not only the project manager of uh, the Intrinsic Impact Study, he is also the director of communications and audience development for Theater Bay Area, and their wonderful executive director, whom I have the uh, privilege of introducing, and that is Brad Erickson. Thank you, Linda. I just want to say a few words. And first of all, uh, the, the kind of participation and support that we've gotten from Linda and what is now Theatre Washington from the very get-go with this project has just been amazing. And I'm really thrilled that Washington and <clears throat> the surrounding area has been part of the six communities that we've been working in over the last couple of years with this project. Um, as I was coming in the door, Linda was you know, saying to me that she was really hoping that the information that we would be hearing about today would be able to live on and would really be something that would be useful and, and you would find ways to implement the ideas that we're going to be talking about today. And I just want to say that very much that is the case. As a service organization, we're, you know, and we tend to be kind of wonky, Clay and I ourselves, um, we like that. But data alone for us as a service organization really um, isn't all that compelling. We want data that's going to be able to be usable by the field to help you do what you do better, to make a deeper impact on your audiences, to make that impression stick and last longer, and that's exactly what this study and the information that you'll be hearing today will be leading you to. Um, we'll be hearing from, um, we'll be hearing about the 18 theaters that we've studied across the country, 18 theaters, six cities, 58 productions, hundreds of performances, and, and 19,000 surveys were turned in. That's the basis of this study. And of course, there were three theaters here in the Washington area that were involved in the, in the project, the arena stage where we are today, Woolly Mammoth and Metro stage over in Virginia. Um, and, and they have been incredibly um, important in the study as well. So you will be coming away, I hope, with ideas that you will be able to follow up on in your own theaters and at your own companies today. And we're finding ways to take the information that we're hearing here and use it with advocacy and policy development as well. We were in New York yesterday and heard from Jenny Leloudis, who runs Art New York there, and she had just used information from this study and in the book that you'll be seeing here as she was presenting just this week before the City Council in New York, 
trying to make new arguments for why New York should be spending $58 million to support the arts. And it was a very impactful message because they had been used to the economic impact um, numbers and they had sort of told her, we've heard those, we know about them, do you have anything new to tell us? And so she was talking to them about the way that the arts are really having a profound impact on communities and on people's lives. And it's that kind of information that we'll be hearing about today. So I'm really thrilled that you're here. I'm thrilled for the participation that we've had in Washington. And I do want to let you know, you'll be hearing more about this today, but as um, we were, Linda and I were talking, this is not just about um, a study that you know some of you were part of and some of you were not, and that's too bad. This is a study that is ongoing. We have continued support from a number of generous um, um, funders that will allow us to continue this um, this kind of study going forward, and we've also been working to make this, this study really accessible and affordable so that every theater company across the country can do this kind of work themselves. So with that in mind, and with lots more to come, I'm going to hand the microphone over to Clay Lord. Oh, I should say many, many thank yous. So thank yous to our many um, funders. That's part of my job up here, and I'm forgetting it. Um, so we need, to, we need to thank our funders, including the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation, the Andrew Mellon Foundation, enormous support from the National Endowment for the Arts, and from the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage, a number of funders as well around the country who have made this um, project possible. I certainly want to thank Alan Brown and Rebecca Radskin, everyone at Wolf Brown, and Clay Lord, who has been the project manager for this over the last two years. So, Clay and Alan. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Clay Lord, and I am the Director of Communications and Audience Development at Theatre Bay Area. We're a regional arts service organization that specializes in theatre and dance. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, we support both individual artists and companies, which makes us a bit of an odd fit to be the ones leading a national study. Um, but uh, hopefully in the next few minutes and few hours, you'll come to understand why we got so passionate about this that we, um, we felt it would impact our particular members more if we were able to engage in a national conversation about this. Um, before we get too far, though, I do want to add my thanks to both Theater Washington and Arena Stage for, for hosting us, and also to the other theaters, Woolly Mammoth, and Metro Stage for being great partners in this work. Um, it, you'll see a slide in a couple minutes that shows you that we had mm, some, somewhere close to 20 to 30 partners in this work total, and it's, it's really, that's the only way we could have done it. Um, and so without them, this wouldn't have been possible. And I also want to thank the folks at HowlRound and Pounding Play. We are live streaming today, which is a very exciting and new experience for me, so hopefully I don't mess it up. Um, and so uh, thank you to them. And welcome. <laughs> so agenda. Um, this whole thing is three hours long, but we do give you breaks in the middle, and there are moments throughout to ask questions. But we also encourage you to raise your hand anytime you have a question. The lights are a bit bright on us, so if we don't see you immediately, wave your hand a little, and, and hopefully that'll jog the eyes. Um, so we're in welcome and introductions right now, and then we're going to go on to what's intrinsic impact and why should you care, why I care, why your Bay Area cares. And, and why um, we think it's a really important um, conversation to be having nationally. Um, and then Alan Brown, who was the, the chief researcher on um, measuring the intrinsic impact of live theater, will be presenting some of the top line results of his report. Um, they're very interesting, exciting results, and um, that'll, those two portions together with the Q&A will take about 75 minutes. And then we'll have a break for 10 minutes. Um, in the second section, we're going to be demonstrating one of the most exciting outcomes of this work, which is an online dashboard. We'll actually be showing you screenshots, but the, um, the dashboard now exists and allows organizations to do this work for a much cheaper, amount, a much lower amount of money than, than um, you could have done it before. Um, it actually integrates an online survey mechanism that then automatically transfers data into a, a database that people can look at immediately and see results with interpretation. Um, so that they can immediately, within 24 hours, have feedback from their audiences and, and be able to possibly augment what they're doing. Um, we'll then speak to representatives from each of the three companies, um, talking through some of their graphs, um, having them tell you a little bit about their experience. And then we'll have a, a kind of group discussion about what the benefits and limitations of impact assessment and any type of assessment are, and why they're equally important to do anyway. And then in part three, we're going to kind of look to the future. We're going to talk um, about why engaging audiences is important, um, why engaging them in getting feedback is important. Um, this uh, concept called the long arc of impact assessment, um, uh, which is basically just looking at 
both um, what we're doing in the future and also what it does to people over time to be able to assess and tell you about the impacts that they're having, and then practical implications of the impact assessment. Um, question and answer. Engaging the field at large, um, future work that we're doing, and then uh, we'll conclude. So that's the agenda. Some quick housekeeping. So um, the executive summary is available online for free, along with some other excerpts from the book. Um, it's available at theaterbayarea.org slash intrinsic impact, and I encourage you to take a look at that. Um, the, the books are um, available down at the gift shop, and um, if you want a book, please go ahead and buy one, um, but don't feel like you are being pressured to. Um, we think it's pretty interesting, and it's got a bunch of interviews with artistic directors from around the country as well um, that, that kind of augment the, or, or add to the, the research that Alan Brown did. My email address is important only if you are interested in doing this work. But I mean, you can email me anyway. But if you're interested in doing this work, it's really um, the best way to do it is to contact me. And we will be, um, later in the presentation, I'll be talking about um, some of the future work that we're doing. We do have some subsidy available for um, 30 arts organizations who want to take part in this work. Um, and we encourage you to, to get in contact with me if you're interested in that. And then the two websites here, intrinsicimpact.org is a free resource that has a lot of kind of the background and history of this work, a bibliography, things like that. And then there's the hashtag, which is pound new beans. Um, we encourage you to tweet. And um, if you do, use that hashtag so we know you did. So who am I? So I already told you that I am the Director of Communications and Audience Development at Theatre Bay Area, but I hope that that's not the most interesting thing about me. Um, and I wanted to start from a different place, which is Max from Where the Wild Things Are. Um, when I was four and a half years old, uh, my first theatrical experience was getting cast as Max in Where the Wild Things Are at my preschool. And um, I didn't know quite who Max was or that he was important, and my teacher kept telling me, trees are important, shrubs are important, Max is important. So I kept telling my parents, trees are important, shrubs are important. And they didn't realize that I was anything special in the, in the play, and so like, my mom thought I was going to be a tree, she didn't bring a camera. She got there, she was very disappointed that I hadn't told her I was Max, because of course she would have gotten it. Anyway, it was, it was the most amazing experience for me. It's, it's one of the few memories that I have from being so young. And um, it's, it's kind of kick-started a life of artistic experience for me. And, and a lot of what we're talking about today is how, um, on an individual level, your artistic life leads you to where you're going. So, for example, for me, this eventually led me to work for Theatre Bay Area, which is an art service organization, and I particularly started working for Theatre Bay Area because of their mission, which is to unite, strengthen, promote, and advance the theatre community of the Bay Area. And the second part is what really got me, which is working on behalf of our conviction that the performing arts are an essential public good, critical to a healthy and truly democratic society, and invaluable as a source of personal enrichment and growth. I was particularly interested in these parts. Essential public good, democratic society, personal enrichment and growth. I thought that art could change the world, and I thought I'd found an organization that believed in that too. And in do, indeed, we do. And as director of communications, I was like, oh, great. Well, now we can talk about that. And then we tried, started trying to. And we realized that for the people we were trying to talk to, we didn't really have the right language to speak to them about these things in terms of what art does. So we started asking our constituents a bunch of different questions, and this is the audience participation part. So here's question one. Why, artists, arts administrators, do you make or consume art? Raise your hand. And I'm not going to move past this until someone answers me. Yes? Because it takes me different places and allows me to meet different people. Because it takes me different places and allows me to meet different people. Good. To know that me and my experiences are not alone. To know that your experience, you and your experiences are not alone. Good. Yes? It helps me to express my feelings. It helps you to express your feelings as, as an art maker or an art watcher? As an art maker. As an art maker. Cool. Anyone else? Yeah. Because you have to. Because you have to. We hear that a lot. Yeah? It uh, allows me to share my culture both as a member of the community and as an individual. It allows you to share your culture as a member of the community and as an individual. Absolutely. So Anne Bogart gives an interview in this book, and, and what she says is that for her, making, making theater, going to theater, the best theater should be like gym for the soul. Which, which basically works out to, you don't want it to be so hard that people can't complete it, but you want them to feel like they made an effort in the end. 
I think that's a really interesting way to think about it, and if you've ever seen a city company production, you know how accurate that description is of what, what Anne Bogart and her, her fellow artists do. Really amazing stuff. So what does the best art do? Like, think about the best artistic experience you have. What did it do to you? Talked about it for weeks, stuck in your head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Provoking new questions for you, but also new questions that you want to ask other people who you may not engage with on a day-to-day -day basis otherwise. So provoking new questions for you, and also encouraging you to engage with other people who might not be in your sphere. Yeah. So on the other hand, I think. Yeah. It makes me want to go out and experience more, and feel more deeply. To go experience more and feel more deeply. That's awesome. Yeah. Connects you to other people. Good. Yep. It challenges, my core it challenges your core beliefs. Absolutely. So this is a patron named Barry Levine. He's a normal patron, except that he and his wife go to a hundred productions a year. So he's kind of what you might call a super patron. <laughs> um, and they've been going to a hundred productions a year for years. They have all of their playbills. I saw them. They're in boxes. It's amazing. And he says that he's talking about Journey's End here, which I don't know how many of you know that show. Um, it's a, a show about a, some soldiers in World War I, and it's basically leading up to them at the end of the show, going over the brink and dying. You feel cheerful. But um, for Barry, three years later, this is his response to being asked about that memory. The experience was just amazing. The emotional impact is bringing tears to my eyes right now. He actually started crying. You would just walk out of there like, wow. You got bam, you got hit like that. It's, it's, it's less articulated than it might be, but maybe that's the point. It's so hard to describe what that is. How do you know that your work's doing that to people? How do you know that it's resonating? So people talking at intermission and afterwards, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and sometimes like, when it's really resonating, they don't even talk, they just thank you. So sometimes when it's resonating a lot, they can't formulate, they just you thank you. Say, you can see that there has been a deep something that they can't find the words for, like Barry's quote mm -hmm. there, there's just not an articulate way to express what happened. Right. And all they can say is thank you. So sometimes it, it actually renders people inarticulate. They can't actually describe what happened to them. Yeah? It reignites a love in a medium they might have been moving away from. It reignites a love in the medium. Yeah. Who's an artistic person here? Artistic director. Okay. So, um, do you ever sit in your audiences? Why? To hear the response as it's happening. To hear their response as it's happening. And what, what does that mean? So you hear them gasp, you hear them clap, you hear them laugh? Or you hear them silent. Or you hear them silent. And is that good or bad, or depends? Depends on the moment. Depends. Mm -hmm. Yeah? There's a sort of way of the group breathing together. There's a I way of the group breathing together. On the same yeah. wavelength. Yeah. So this is Oscar Eustace. He's um, the artistic director of the public. And um, there were four other artistic directors in the book who basically said the same thing, which is that I sit in the audience and I listen and I just feel it. And as an artistic director, who's lived my life in the theater, that's enough. Yeah. And on the other side of the coin, you've got a patron like, um, this is Sean McKenna, he's another super patron in the Bay Area. Um, and he says the way he can tell that it's a moving production is that it sends a tingle through his whole body. And that it doesn't happen very often. Um, but that he, it happens often enough that he knows it's going to happen again. Which to me sounds like nothing so much as a drug hit. <laughs> but that's okay with me, you know. So, so that's what we do. So then we get to this question. How do you convey your organization's success at doing that to your funders, to your government officials, to your board members? Yeah. We use actual feedback from our audience members. So anecdotal stories from your audience members. Yeah. yeah. You show them you sold tickets. You show them you sold tickets. Yeah. You use numbers. And anecdote, absolutely. And we're going to talk a little bit about anecdote versus numbers. It, it turns out that anecdote is where we feel comfortable and numbers are where we have to go. 
So this is Diane Ragsdale, this is a very long quote, but the basic gist of it is that if you keep ranking things the way you've always been ranking them, which is often through numbers, then you keep getting the same people at the top, the same organizations at the top. But if you start looking at some other things like who reaches everyone who's not going to those big organizations, or who's actually generating a community-wide discourse, who is changing people's lives, then you get different rankings. It's an interesting question. This is Nicki Minaj and Anna Winter. <laughs> Nicki Minaj, as you can tell, crafted her outfit from Michael's. Um, this is at a fashion show, and I can't believe they were actually seated together, but this is my favorite picture in the world. <laughs> Nikki's anecdote. She's free-spirited, she's kind of non-specific, but she's bright, she's interesting. She's where we're comfortable. And then Anna Winter over here, with her gaudy necklace, she's the numbers. But here's the problem. They shouldn't really be together, at least they kind of look strange together. And, no matter whether you're talking about advocacy, or internal communication, or fundraising, or board oversight, Anna Winter's always going to win. And the reason is because Anna Winter's the one who has the money. So, all of these people that we're talking to, unfortunately, are the people who have control over kind of the financial fate of a lot of our income. And so then it becomes a problem for us to only speak an anecdote when what they really want is something harder and faster and more consistent. So this is David Kilpatrick. He's the executive director of a small community theater in La Crosse, Wisconsin. And he is the, um, the inspiration for the title of the book. And he says, as artists and arts administrators, we've turned ourselves into bean counters because the people we deal with, what they count as beans. So, this is where we are right now, but wouldn't it be nice if we could get here? <laughs> and we could make what was unmeasurable, measurable. That's where we were at Theater Bay Area. We were looking for a way to do this, looking for a way to take all of these inspirational things that we had found out from our community and turn them into something that would resonate the same way that we had 80% capacity on the show and we generated X thousand dollars for the restaurant down the street resonated with our funders, our government officials. And then Brad heard this in a presentation that Alan Brown was giving at um, the National Arts Marketing Conference in Miami. And he heard Alan say this, and then he heard Alan go on to talk about what this meant to him. If you can describe something, you can measure it. And Alan first heard this from Ed Pauly, who's the evaluation director at the Wallace Foundation. And this is the cornerstone of all of the thinking that has gone into this work at Wolf Brown for the last five years. And, and it's led to what's, what we're calling intrinsic impact, which is the intellectual, social, emotional, and empathetic impact of art on an individual. And the important part is the end, where it's measured using a standard metric and a common vocabulary, so that everyone is speaking the same language, but you're talking about the right things. This was a big, exciting, light bulb moment for our organization, and so we immediately went out and we talked to all of our funder friends that we could find. The Doris Duke Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation, the Pew Center for Arts and Heritage in Philadelphia, the San Francisco Arts Commission, City of San Jose, Theater Development Fund. We also made partnerships with LA Stage Alliance, the Theater Alliance of Greater Philadelphia, Art New York, Theater Washington, Arts Midwest. We've now added Arts Boston and the League of Chicago Theaters. We did an open application process and had over a hundred theaters respond to us, asking to be a part of this work. And unfortunately, we only had funding for 18 of them, but we have 18 of the most diverse theaters we could find in terms of size, type of programming, geography. It spans from a community theater in a, in a town of 35,000 people to Roundabout Theater, one of the largest arts nonprofits in the world. We did interviews with um, eight other artistic directors who were not actually involved in this study, as well as 12 artistic directors that were, compiled them all around this question of what is the role of audience feedback in the creation of art? When do you start thinking about your audiences in your artistic process? And the conversations are amazing. And they've really informed a lot of the thinking about how this work is applicable. And in the end, two years of research later, and 
Honestly, this isn't supposed to be part of my job, but it certainly is exciting to do. Two years of research later, we've had 11 months of surveying 26 theaters, 12 cities, 24 original interviews, with four patrons included there. Four original essays from people like Diane Ragsdale, Arlene Goldbard, Rebecca Novick. 58 productions, 60,000 surveys went out, placed by hand by very intrepid ushers, marketing directors, amazing people who then went back afterwards and counted all the ones that were left over so that we could figure out a response rate of over 40%. It's an amazing amount of work that a lot of people did and it's culminated in this book and this conversation and we hope that it generates a, a whole future of thinking differently about how we talk about the value of what we do. So the book is available in person today, as I said, it's also online. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Alan so that he can actually speak through the results of the research. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Clay. And good morning. Uh, before I start, I'd just like to thank you all for taking such a big chunk of time out of your day to be here. I'm so honored that you would do that, and honored to be on this incredible stage in this amazing building today at Arena Stage. Um, uh, we're having quite the excellent adventure. Uh, it started in Chicago, Minneapolis, Boston, New York, here today and tomorrow in Philadelphia, and then San Francisco and Los Angeles next week. Um, so it's um, a bit of a blur, uh, but uh, there are some really wonderful treasured colleagues here. Um, and first of all, I'd like to ask, just so I get a sense of who's here, are there any students or interns here in attendance today? Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Woolly Mammoth folks, just so I know where you are. Great. Thank you. Um, Metro Stage, Carolyn. Thank you for coming, and Arena Stage staff. Many of you, thank you for coming. I think we have some friends from the Kennedy Center here. A number of you. Wow, didn't mean to close down the Kennedy Center. <laughs> That's fantastic, and uh, we have also some friends from the National Endowments for the Arts who are here with us today. A couple of you, yay. Uh, and Jonathan. NASA. Uh, wonderful. I'm so honored that you're here. Um, I'm going to uh, go quickly through some of the research findings, um, really just sort of surf the highlights of the findings, um, hopefully provoke you a little bit um, to uh, think about impact assessment. I, I hope that you go home from this session with a more nuanced understanding of impact assessment in general the different approaches to it, the, the pluses and minuses of undertaking impact assessment, uh, why uh, a theater or another or arts group would, why would you get involved with this? Um, and really able to kind of lead a conversation within your organization about uh, impact in general. Um, so as Clay mentioned, uh, our methodology, um, involve paper surveying, and it's very intentional um, because we needed to uh, gather data from uh, a, 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 as random as possible a cross-section of audiences. When you email ticket buyers, you're only hearing from decision makers, mostly in the ticket people who acquire tickets. If you want to hear from all the other people who come with the ticket buyers, you actually have to go into the venue with a paper form. Uh, and that is what we did. There, there are benefits, of course, of going with online surveying, which, which relate to the economics and timeliness of reporting. Um, but in this case, we took the a road less, the more difficult road. Um, and um, uh, we, ca we, we counted the forms that were left behind so we could calculate what we call a pickup rate, which was 65%. And we encouraged theaters to reuse their surveys that were left over distribute them at another performance just to get more, a higher pickup rate. Um, and our response rate as a uh, function of the pickup uh, was 45% on average. Okay, so 45% is not the percentage of all the surveys we printed. It's the percentage of surveys that were taken home from the venue. 
Um, and that ranged from, you know, quite a bit. And there were some interesting regional differences in response rates. People in the Midwest take surveys. <laughs> <laughs> Confirming a long line of market research uh, assumptions. Um, God bless the people in La Crosse, Wisconsin. They were just waiting for our surveys. <laughs> and they took them. Um, I have to say that uh, it's very much, you know, you kind of get out of this what you put into it in, turn of, in terms of the effort level of um, uh, messaging to the audience that this is important to us. We ask you to fill out this form for a reason. Uh, so, so in some uh, sites, uh, curtain announcements uh, were done, lobby signage. Uh, and other response enhancement efforts, and the response rate very much had to do with that. At the end of the day, uh, people fill out surveys because they want to support you. There was no incentive involved here. Uh, and because of that, we'll know in a moment, there's a bias we call loyalty bias in, in all art surveys, really, is that people who, are, who want to support you are more likely to fill out a survey. Um, we also surveyed staff at the 18 theaters about the impacts they anticipated their audience would report. And we asked them to do that before the show opened, before they actually saw the, uh, an audience react to the show. Because we wanted to try to capture what the staff was thinking about impact. And it went right into the, all those staff surveys went right into the dashboard and were displayed right next to the audience's actual response. And you'll see some of that data as we go through the dashboard today. It's a great conversation starter. Uh, so in terms of questionnaire design, um, we produced a template uh, with some mandatory questions and many optional questions, and each theater could customize their survey to some extent based on their own sensibility, their own sort of artistic uh, philosophy. Uh, so, uh, as we go through here, I'll kind of point out mandatory questions and optional questions. Um, but this allowed the theater, you know, our bottom line is three pages of questions in 11 point type. No squeezing. So, you know, in a hall you have light issues, you have people who have visual uh, issues, so we really can't go smaller than 11 point type, I feel, in a venue. Um, before any discussion of data from any researcher, you always need to ask about limitations and disclose bias. Uh, there's always some bias. Uh, and in this case, it's very, very important before we get into this that you understand some of these limitations. Um, and the, really, the, the main message here is um, uh, that impact results across sites, across works of art, are fundamentally not comparable. Okay, you really can't compare uh, emotional resonance of a production of Cats at a big musical theater uh, venue in Los Angeles with um, a production of The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs at Woolly Mammoth here. For a different audience, different work of art, different venue, we really have to bear this in mind as we go through here, because there's a lot of um, contextual benefit to seeing impact scores kind of comparatively, but it's not a contest. A work of art does not necessarily, should not necessarily produce every impact. You know, they're not, that, that is never the artist's intention, necessarily. We, we, and we shouldn't second guess the, the creator's intention. So I guess that's the, that's the main thing, is what we, we do encourage is within an institution, look at your impact results, because it is the, basically the similar audience in the same venue, and the work of art is different. And I think there you've got to let more, much more of a leg to stand on in terms of comparability. Um, so, as with any survey, there's uh, uh, some openness to interpretation. We tried hard to use simple language in our survey protocol. 
uh, but ultimately there were some words and phrases that were subject to interpretation. Um, my first, this is merely for your entertainment, uh, is, is age uh, patterns with subscription uh, package. And, um, you know, if that's not a clear picture, uh, there never is one. Uh, uh, and uh, I'm not going to dwell on this. This could be a whole other conference. Uh, but uh, our data certainly showed, um, and, and by the way, we did not weight our data for anything. Uh, subscribers responded at a much higher rate than single ticket buyers, but we didn't have anything to weight to. Uh, so we have lots of single ticket buyers in the sample, so we can look at them, but we didn't weight the data to try to adjust the representativeness. We're just presenting you with kind of raw data. So, one, and this is really one of the things we're going to talk about this morning is, is single ticket buyers. You know, and the distinction between a single ticket buyer and a subscriber is kind of blurry because there are lots of single ticket buyers who used to subscribe but don't anymore. Uh, there are lots of very knowledgeable single ticket buyers. Subscribers certainly don't have the corner on that. Um, and you can see here the, you know, the age. So let's first look at motivations. We asked, we provided uh, respondents with a list of 11 motivations and asked them to tick three that best represent their reason for being in the theater that night. Um, and this graph displays seven of them. Uh, the uppermost blue line is, is, you know, heaven forbid to relax or escape, you know. And I think sometimes we kind of forget that people just go out to actually have a good time. Uh, and, and actually what's so interesting is that goes up with age and then kind of uh, eases a little bit at the, at the 55 and over level. Um, and right below that is to be emotionally moved or inspired, you know, as a motivation, you know. Some people do go out really wanting to be moved, and other people maybe don't think about it so much, but that also goes up a lot, uh, and then eases. The green line, you know, to spend quality time with family members, thank heavens, goes up through the child-rearing years, and then plunges. <laughs> really want to do a focus group with those people towards the right-hand side of that scale, um, where just other priorities kick, kick in. Um, to revisit a familiar, and this is really interesting, it is, is a correlation with age. Now, I think this has a lot to do with the musicals that were in our sample. There were 12 or 15 musicals in our sample, um, and uh, there's a very important phenomenon happening in the impact system of um, uh, people valuing familiar art. Uh, it's the Christmas Carol phenomenon, the Nutcracker, even with opera, people going back to see the same operas, musicals. Um, this, we have been very focused over the years on aesthetic growth, you know, stretching people beyond, you know, introducing them to something new, because that's a, that's a value that's prized by many artistic uh, folks, want to stretch their audience. But there's another side to that, which is the value, the very legitimate value people get from reconnecting with art they know and love. And, and those two things coexist. And it's, it's interesting, as the age people go into the higher age cohorts, we find that revisiting familiar art, it becomes a more prominent motivation. Okay, the black line is very intuitive. Uh, because someone invited you, you know, younger folks are much more likely to come because someone else invited them, uh, which really just speaks to the, the, the social importance, social, uh, the, the importance of social context in driving arts attendance for young adults uh, is, is huge. And then the yellow line is interesting. This is for work or educational purposes. You know, we wouldn't expect that to be high. But for the youngest cohorts of adults, there is a, um, you know, some of whom are students, 
Uh, there is a personal connection to the art form, I believe. I, I know this from some other studies we've done, that, that the, the very younger adults are actors themselves or in school or studying theater or, you know, have some personal connection. Um, and therefore, so the, the backstory and the motivations is that if you look, uh, because this data set is so large, those of you who are researchers will hopefully relish this. This is almost 20,000 cases. Almost any statistic you run in this data set is statistically significant because there's so many cases. So, so it really allows us to dig deeply into the relationships between variables because there's so much data. And we have to look not just at statistical stability, but at what we call, in, as researchers, effect size. The amount of the variance explained uh, uh, between, between variables. So I'm going to talk a, a little bit because you know, I can kind of distort the results and tell you that this is statistically significant, but it might be a really weak relationship. And you have to be careful here. So, sure enough, the people who show up to discover something new, that's not on this graph, but it's one of the motivations, reported higher intellectual stimulation. The people who show up to be emotionally moved reported higher emotional resonance. The people who show up to learn about or celebrate their cultural heritage were more likely to report social bonding outcomes. All right, so there's a very subtle but significant relationship between the intentions, the motivations people have, and the impacts they report. Which is fascinating if you think about it, is that intentionality creates outcomes like I suppose anything else in life, right? So setting up, you know, if I'm a, you're a marketer, I think this really means setting up accurate expectations is really important. Um, we uh, asked all the theaters to report what percentage of the house was sold uh, on the uh, night of the performance, and this allowed us to run a regression analysis between anticipation levels reported by audience members and the percent capacity sold of the house. And you see there, there's a discernible relationship as the house gets fuller, anticipation levels get higher. There's a statistically significant relationship there. It's not a huge effect size. But I can tell you confidently that people who are in fuller houses report higher levels of anticipation. It just makes sense, right? Now, there may be other cofactors there, like the, if there's a star in the production or if it's a more popular production, therefore it might be sold better. You know, there, there are other reasons for this, but I think this... Um, speaks to using appropriately sized houses for the work to kind of, so the, there's a natural relationship between the venue and the art. Uh, because when the venue is full, people report higher anticipation. And as you'll see, this actually drives impact. By the way, if you all have questions or comments, just stick your hand up or holler at me. Yes? Um, can you unpack what anticipation means in this yeah. context? Um, mm -hmm. Because you're, you're saying that people report directly following a performance that they were anticipating it. So, good question. Good question. Um, the, the question was for the viewing audience, can you unpack what anticipation is? Yes. Um, in the original study of Impact from 2006, we actually surveyed people before and after, and we, using a control number, we paired their surveys, um, and uh, that allowed us to, in the, in the pre-performance survey, explore what we call readiness to receive. The familiarity, the, uh, you know, are they normally, do they normally go out, or is this a new and different experience for them, and their level of anticipation. The, the specific wording of the question is, 
how excited were you before the performance started? But because we couldn't afford to do pre-performance and post-performance survey, we had to ask people afterwards to speculate as to their level of anticipation before it started. And um, that's a tricky cognitive exercise. <laughs> Uh, and we just have to believe people. Well, and there, there is, I guess there's equal possibility that there, the size of the fullness of the house is affecting anticipation, or that people who anticipate a show more are more likely to buy tickets, so more people are buying tickets, so the house is fuller. You can't really, you can't really, the, the correlation can run either direction, is that correct? Right. Yeah. You can't prove causality. Um, but we'll get into anticipation a little more. Um, so, um, on, on, uh, on, a number of our questions related to pre- and post-performance engagement, and I'll share with you some of those results here. Um, and um, this, this graph charts a couple of pre-performance indicators by age cohort. Um, that red line in the middle there, orange line, is the percentage of people across all these productions who said they did anything to prepare. About twenty-five percent. So, so stop right there and ask yourself: You know, is twenty-five percent an acceptable level of preparation? Um, you know, and of course the question is: Well, what do you mean by prepare? <laughs> right. Well, we actually asked a follow-up question in many of the surveys: What did you do to prepare? Uh, and it's very, very interesting what people consider preparation. Um, some people uh, who separately reported reading a review did not report preparation, and other people who read a review did report preparation. So there's ambiguity. Some people think reading a review or preview is preparation. Other people don't. Uh, Searching for information online. Um, interesting, a lot of people cited Wikipedia, which I thought is so interesting given how much effort we all put into producing our own synopses. Um, and, and for some of the productions, especially the Shakespeare work and the work based, based on a piece of literature, a lot of people are going back and referring to the source literature, and in some cases, reading a book or a play before attending it, which is amazing. But look at the relationship between reading a preview, reading a review by a professional critic, that's the green line, look at the relationship between that and age cohort. And this really tells a story, you know, and contrast that to the percentages who say they read comments from written by friends or family, you know, uh, on face, mostly on Facebook, I imagine. You know, there's, there's generational differences going on here, abundantly clear. There's a big shift going on in, in terms of who is who is reading criticism and sort of who they who they believe. Um, there was another a story just before we go on. Um, we also ask people, how familiar are you with the story, with the cast, and with the playwright? Uh, and in, in looking at familiarity against anticipation, it was familiarity with the story uh, was much more highly correlated with anticipation than familiarity with the cast or the playwright. So the story kind of knowing the story tends to lead to higher levels of anticipation. Yes? Uh, by story, do you mean as like the story of the story? Yeah, the plot. The plot yeah. Uh-huh. There was another study um, that came out around movies. It, I think the media nicknamed it the spoiler study that basically gave the same finding, which is that um, people who actually know the whole plot of a movie say that they enjoy it more than people who don't which is fascinating. I'm not sure that it leads to 
reveal every plot twist in your show, but um, one of the things that we've been advising is perhaps in your marketing materials, um, try to consider a less ambiguous image for your art than you might otherwise. Um, if you feel like it's gonna it's gonna be a show that people might not know very much about, so that they at least get a hint about the era or some major plot piece or you know some structural thing. Yes. Yes. Ten percent of the variance in anticipation is explained by familiarity with the story. Cast? No, company. So producing. The, the producing company. Oh no, that was not an item. Yeah. So messaging about story, that's what I take away, is the importance of messaging about story. All right, let's look at post-performance engagement. Um, you know, just generally a downward trend here. Uh, by age, which is very interesting, uh, is that there's, there's a tendency you know, except with regard to reading the program book afterwards, <laughs> which is really interesting. It's provo pro provocative. We, I tend to think of program books as preparatory in nature, mostly. And what we're learning through this study is that the program book for a lot of people, especially older folks, is a meaning-making instrument something people go back to afterwards. And I'm not sure how much thinking we give the program book. Uh, if we look at it through this lens, uh, if we might uh, add some other kinds of content to our program books that would help people discuss a play afterwards, perhaps ask questions of each other on the way home. Yes? Yeah, we're surveying people within 24 hours. Um, <clears throat> so at the top of that is that red line, email or speak to a friend. You know, that's word of mouth, basically. It, and, and this won't go into the detail, but other studies, you know, the dominant mode of post-performance engagement is talking about the work on the way home. Like, how much did you pay a consultant to figure that out? <laughs> <laughs> Like, of course it is, you know? And, but I think a lot of theaters spend a lot of energy producing in-venue discussions when the larger win is eliciting conversation between patrons outside of the venue. And I, I don't know that we as a field have really applied ourselves to that challenge as best we can. Uh, so other items here, you can see um, the green line is search for information online, the blue line react online through, source, through social media. It's kind of age driven and at the very bottom is attend a post-performance discussion. And that's merely a reflection of the availability, limited availability of these discussions at the theaters that were surveyed. Uh, okay, one of my favorite questions, probably my favorite question, the whole survey. Did you leave the performance with questions you would have liked to have asked the actors, director, or playwright? We call this our unanswered questions question. And 35% of all audiences, on average, said yes, I left with questions. And 98% of those people actually told us what their questions are. And they phrased them as questions. And this is so rich. We're not asking people, did you like it or hate it? We're saying, what questions did you leave with? And, and, and you can read these questions and really understand how the work is resonating. And we categorize the productions by type, from experimental all the way over to contemporary musicals. And on average, of course, different kinds of works generate more or less questions. You know, uh, uh, look, you know, this is the percent 
uh, who left without answer questions. The uh, low is uh, it's a wonderful life the radio play. I've seen lower. Mama mia. Mama mia. <laughs> Which is a good thing. Yeah. Because you don't want a bunch of unanswered questions at the end of the year. <laughs> to a high of almost 70% for um, Theater at Boston Court's production of El Camino Real. Um, and what's interesting is uh, there, there were two pairs of productions in our sample. Uh, same play, different location. Uh, the green dots there are the two productions of Let Me Down Easy, one of which was uh, produced by Arena Stage. Uh, very similar proportion of audience members leaving with questions they'd like to ask Anna Devere Smith. Um, two different productions of Ruined, one of which was here in Arena Stage, another was at Berkeley Rep. But very different, very different levels of unanswered questions. And this is fascinating to me, we can't really understand this, why, you know, what might explain the difference? You know, was it the production? Was it, is it the, the way the theater engaged their audience? Is it their history of engaging uh, uh, audiences? You know, is it good or bad that people leave with unanswered questions? Depends what they do. Depends what they do with it, she said. What do you guys have questions? <laughs> Depends on the questions, absolutely. Uh-huh. I mean, we consider, if you leave with unanswered questions, uh, we take that as an indicator of intellectual stimulation. It's like the wheels are turning. You have been provoked to the extent that you have questions. Now, your questions might be, you know, how did, how did you sew that costume? Or they might be, why did the plot take that turn? Or in many cases, why did the playwright title the play that title? It's amazing. It, we, really looked at, we really looked at the types of questions people were answering and the categories. There's a mountain of qualitative data in this, and there's at least 10 thesis papers, I'm convinced, for those of you who are students. Um, questions you know about inspiration? Uh, go ahead yes. to the previous slide. Uh -huh. Which production of Ruined represents which data um, point? I'm not supposed to say, because it's not a contest. <laughs> um, but in this community, where I mean, I think a lot of people are familiar with one over the other, um, so... Actually, I've heard, actually, I've I'm not sure. So, what I will say yeah. is that um, my hypothesis is, I don't actually know my hypothesis that Berkeley Rep is the one that had more questions. And um, I, I think that that's basically just because they have um, a very concerted culture. I'm, I, I'm not saying Arena doesn't, but for many, many years they have had a concerted culture of engaging their audience and having them do um, post-performance stuff related to kind of questioning. Um, but it's also not, it is not a good or bad thing. And I think that's really important to say. And the other side of that is perhaps there are fewer unanswered questions because the post-performance engagement was in some ways more successful. Um, Arena, for example, I believe, until, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, did post-performance discussions after almost every performance of Rome. And so that means that a higher percentage of those people had an opportunity to have a conversation about that work and then they filled out the survey. So it's totally possible that they just had some of their questions answered. What's more interesting is actually looking at the content of the questions. Um, we've been experimenting with word clouds and you'll see some of them for some other questions in a, in a second. But drawing those questions into the word cloud program is really fascinating because then you can basically see themes, you can see um, moments that are jumping out to people, um, and you can then craft materials that answer those questions or you can leave them unanswered, but maybe provoke that question in more people, for example, by passing out a sheet of paper with questions after the show and encouraging them to go home and talk about it. Okay. Um, what's the correlation between um, people staying for an afterwards program and you know, unanswered questions that the show might uh -huh. So the question was, what's the correlation between post-performance discussions and um, amounts of unanswered questions? Yeah, that's a really great question. 
Uh, uh, I don't have a, an answer. Uh, I, ha I have to go back into the data set and actually see if we can answer that. But I think it's, a, it's an interesting hypothesis. Um, and I, I'm vi just generally aware that, that attendance at post-performance discussions is in increasing in general. More people are staying, but that's very anecdotal. You know, I'd love to hear from you all kind of the big, the big trend. Jen? I was actually going to say, the other thing that's interesting, on the Let Me Down Easy conference, right? That's also Berkeley Rock Arena stage. Yes, the so Let Me Down Easy is both Arena and Berkeley Rock as well. So right. in my mind, it comes down to the production. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because it's, again, two company comparisons. Let Me Down Easy had very similar results. Ruined had very similar results. Well, and what's interesting about Ruined as well is that if you look at the actual impact, in, like the summary impact indicators for the two productions, they're almost identical. So even though they're two separate productions at, as a footprint, an impact footprint, they're almost the same, which is why this kind of gave us so much pause and discussion is because these are 20% off from each other. Yeah. Yeah. Couldn't you also look at that though as the difference of the community that it's being performed in? Absolutely, it could be the difference of the community and, and um, you know, it could be the difference in um, percentage of different demographics within that community. Well, um, also just, you know, looking at the difference, with, like looking at DC, you have a population or an audience that's very familiar with international relations and the healthcare debate, mm -hmm. um, which could have. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the community could ask. Right. So, so kind of the, the bottom line here is, for me, is looking at your seasons and your artists, can you anticipate which artists, which works of art, will generate the most unanswered questions? And what can you do to, to essentially anticipate what those questions will be and to catalyze more discussion, uh, allow people more opportunities to verbalize their questions, perhaps discuss them with others, perhaps discuss them with artists or, or dramaturgs, and essentially, or hear other people ask questions. Because when people get answers to their questions, they're making meaning from the art, and as we'll see, magnifying the impact of the art. So moving on, uh, whoops, yeah. Do, do you have any correlation between unanswered or answered questions and satisfaction? Yes, yes. Because questions are always good, even if they're not answered, but I don't know if that's Yes, we'll see, that's my last slide. <laughs> um, so bless you, woolly mammoth folks. We're showing your, hanging out all of your laundry here. Um, these are the three productions. Uh, at Woolly Mammoth, the, the green area on this radar chart is um, the Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs. It's been in the news lately. Really interesting twist of events. Uh, a production of Oedipus El Rey is the sort of brownish red area, and the blue area is production of a play, a delicious play called Booty Candy. Um, and since the Woolly people are here, you're, you're going to get a little. Um, background on all three of these productions after the break. Um, but as you can see, just visually here, you've really got very different impact levels for these productions. Um, and particularly the uh, one-man show, Agony and Ice Steve Jobs, really resonated uh, with the audiences in terms of the emotional impact uh, the, you know, the overall strength of the emotional response, the feelings of empathy. Here's an indicator for you. Did you leave the performance resolved to make a change in your life? Well, Woolly Mammoths elected that indicator because they felt strongly that was an outcome they were looking for from their work. And you can see how high that Steve Jobs play score. People left that play wanting to make a difference, wanting to actually get involved, uh, I guess it's about labor abuses in China, right? Um, and gaining, uh, you know, our, our lead indicator of intellectual stimulation on the bottom there is, did you gain new insight or learning? You know, very different profile. 
Then th this other sort of more, um, I don't know what you want to call it, um, didactic outcome. Is, did you think about the structure of the play during the, you know, during the play? Uh, and that was actually highest for booty candy, and, and maybe we'll come back and someone from Woolly Mammoth will explain why that might be true. Um, aesthetic growth, much higher for Oedipus El Rey and booty candy, and much lower for Agony, you know, and actually it's just in terms of being exposed to something new, right? So this just, I just want to give you a flavor for kind of what it looks like when you put a lot of this data into one graph, and you're looking at sort of what we call a footprint, an impact footprint of different productions. And you can imagine what this would feel like if this were, these were your productions. Are we, are we going to talk to Willie and hear what they yes. feel about? And exactly. Kind of that is precisely what will happen after the break. Um, roundabout. Different theater, different market. Anything goes. Big musical production. Uh, really resonated emotionally. Um, which is interesting that you have you have the added elements of music and dancing, as well as uh, drama. Um, <clears throat> the importance of being earnest is the blue area. Um, very sort of classic. Production, except what was different here is that Brian Bedford played Lady Bracknell, um, which um, clearly had an influence on the impact. Generated a lot of questions. What was it like playing a woman? Are you looking for other roles where you could play a woman? Yeah. It was very interesting. Joanna? Yes, we're just about to get there. Um, we did ask frequency in reference to that theater, not theater in general, theater going in general, but that theater. Um, um, <clears throat> plays and musicals. So we have 58 production, we classified plays versus musicals. Now, I, I can't, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that all musicals categorically have different impacts on average than all plays. There were 12 musicals, which may or may not be representative of the world of musicals. But you do, you know, nevertheless, we wanted to do at least kind of an exploratory analysis here. And yes, plays and musicals do have different impact footprints, at least the ones we, we had. A little higher captivation levels for musicals, a little higher emotional feeling emotionally charged, but much higher intellectual impacts for plays. Uh, which, in, you know, if you look at the nature of the works, there's more experimental work, there are new pl plenty of new plays in here, and you really see um, the, the uh, higher intellectual impacts. Um, a much higher aesthetic validation for musicals, social, the sense of connectedness with others in the audience was higher for musicals. All right, yes? Alan, can I ask, so what you just said, for example, aesthetic, I'm trying to figure out how to use these, if at all. Uh, aesthetic validation was... Reconnecting with comfortable art yeah, you know and love. Yeah, those are, those are average ratings. Very large data sets. So they're very significant statistically. Um, but again, almost everything is, is significant. The, the thing about this graph is you can visually see the distance between the observations. And in this case, you're looking at almost a full point on a five-point scale. So I could imagine that to be, for example, 10 more people out of 100 say that about musicals versus plays, or, I mean, I'm just trying to put it into the room. Yeah, um, I, I'd have to go, you know, kind of frame that, help you frame that, but, you know, on average, respondents 
reported higher levels of aesthetic validation for musicals by a factor of, say, 20%. And I'm looking at one to five as if it were zero to 100, That's roughly, okay. yeah. Okay, thanks. And Joanne, I think this gets to your question. We looked at um, decision makers and the next slide after this is gonna be about frequency. And you know, sure enough, people who said they were decision makers reported categorically higher impacts. Well, of course they do. <laughs> they got it together, they sought out information, they convinced other people to go with them. <laughs> and they're more, they report higher impacts. Now, your question, Joanna, brings up an interesting issue, which is sort of what's the difference between impact and satisfaction? And we explored that in the original MUPS, in the original major university presenter study, and it really, impact is a, um, you don't need to ask satisfaction questions when you have impact data, because they're largely the same thing. People who report higher impacts are more satisfied. I think satisfaction, is great to ask in reference to extrinsic aspects of the performance. The toilets, the lobby, the parking. Satisfaction, great. But if you're going to ask about the art, we really don't need to know how satisfied were you. We need to know what impact did it have on you. It's more germane. It's better. Uh, because it, it's actually, and it actually is the same, almost the same thing. So, uh, I think this just asks questions about decision makers and how can we use, how can we empower decision makers because they're more deeply staked in the experience as sort of ambassadors to the other people in their party. And possibly the most provocative finding of the whole study here is um, this is essentially free, a story about frequency. Single ticket buyers reported categorically higher impacts than subscribers. And not just by a little. Why are more frequent attendees less satisfied on average? Yes? Uh, the decision maker aspect. With some of the single ticket buyer, they specifically decided to go to that show. When you're a subscriber, you're making a decision to see every show. They wouldn't necessarily right. have the same intentionality. So they're in mm -hmm. to those kind of things. So more decision makers are choosing to be there. Correct. Right? Subscribers buy a basket of risk. <laughs> Honestly, they right? That's that's essentially and and you know, it's really kind of amazing is a lot of subscribers actually forget what they've bought. And it's like, honey, we're going to the theater tonight. Well, what, what's on, you know, what, what's on? I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll talk about it on the way. <laughs> and I think you're right. I think there are other factors as well, yes? Yeah. It's a blend. Exactly. Right. I think most of the subscriptions across these theaters were fixed series, but there were some choose your own. Yes. No. Just the Correct. But they were asked about um, variations on questions to try and get at how strongly they felt about the company. And they universally responded very highly in terms of loyalty to the company, which is possibly another thing to talk about here, which is that subscribers are subscribing to the company and the single ticket buyers are buying the show. And I also want to just point out that single ticket buyers here could be high frequency single ticket buyers who have chosen not to subscribe to you. So it's not just one-off people, although it is mostly very low-frequency buyers at your company. Yeah. So this I had an interesting conversation with Ben Cameron about this, this sort of emergence of the super strain of single-ticket buyers you know, who, are, who are very knowledgeable, 
have the resources, maybe don't have the time, can't commit. Um, so, and this is consistent with other, other research audience segmentation studies I've done in opera, theater, classical music. Uh, there seems to be a segment of the, you know, the most active buyers, there's a segment that's loyal to the institution and will basically go do, and, you know, go hear you read the phone book. And there's another segment of uh, buyers whose loyalty is to the art form, not the institution. And it's a very subtle but important distinction. Uh, it's just a big deal, I think, especially in opera. It's, it's, you know, there's people, they're very knowledgeable, they're going to pick exactly what they want to go to. And it's a challenge, you know, because they're, what they're basically saying is, we, we, you know, we love you, we love your work, we're having very impactful experiences, but we're not coming back frequently, <laughs> as frequently as you'd like. And I think that's a question for you to take, take home and really think about. This is a little counterintuitive to me. Uh, if infrequent attenders are having more impactful experiences, you know, what will it take to get them to come more frequently? Or is that even a, a valid proposition? Well, and for us as an art service organization, um, we're taking this as, as a positive. We're, we're, I mean, there's a, there's a bit of a theoretical jump, but, I, you know, we're looking at our list co-op data right now, which in San Francisco has 1.6 million households. And for example, we're trying to identify if there are clusters of arts organizations that might, using actual data, have more in common in terms of crossover rates and types of programming and might be interested in doing a multi-org version of a subscription that then would allow people who were curating their own experience to curate it across organizations and, and therefore attend more frequently, just not always with you. Which of course doesn't bring money in your door, but ideally increases um, the amount of arts attendance over time in a whole community, which ultimately does raise attendance. Okay, I'm going to uh, wrap up here as quickly as I can because we need to break. Um, and we will have a Q&A before we break, so... Sure. Um, <laughs> well, no, just because there are a couple questions, so we're just going to wait. There. We had some fun with open ends. We asked people what emotions were you feeling when you walked out of the theater. And it just, just, just unleashed this tidal wave of qualitative data. <laughs> um, and so we generated some word clouds. And uh, <laughs> I, just, I just love word clouds. Uh, because they just sum up so much information. Uh, the juxtaposition of anger and hope here. Sadness, horrified, disgusted, despair, sorrow. This is a heavy emotional impact. And you have to look at this and basically in reference to the work and the, the intention of the playwright and the goal of the theater in presenting it and ask, did you achieve your artistic outcome? Totally different impact here. You know, almost all kind of joyful, positive stuff. There's a little bit of sadness here, not a lot. And then, Wooly, here's your booty candy. <laughs> I mean, dramedy has had the, 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 you know, the, the bifurcation of emotions here is extraordinary. And, you know, what's really interesting here is confused and disappointed for me. And I, I you know, don't take that as bad because from the playwright standpoint, that could mean success. And I believe actually in some, in a, some sense it did is because the playwright was hoping to provoke people uh, to question some of their own values and beliefs. So, 
to see confused, you know, is actually the outcome, the desired outcome here. Okay, we'll get into this a little more. So, you know, this is data. You know, would you potentially include a word cloud in a grant report? I'm hearing from funders who are interested in impact assessment because they wish their grantees would talk about something besides ticket sales in their grant reports and critical reviews. So this is as far, I'm going to wrap up with this slide, this is as far as I've been able to take impact assessment. Because we have this enormous body of data. Now we can really test these relationships. So if you start with familiarity and preparation, right, is all the stuff you can do to set up the experience. Particularly, you know, uh, promoting familiarity with the story we talked about, but also just helping people feel welcome in your space. And whatever preparation you can encourage people to do. All of that has a positive effect on anticipation. How much are you looking forward to this? Right, the R squared, this is a measure of um, effect size. Uh, the, the, these two things in their totality explain 13% of the variance in anticipation. Anticipation is like the floor of impact. It's the baseline condition going into the experience. Anticipation has a big effect on captivation. How absorbed were you? Captivation is the gateway, is the linchpin in the whole system for me. It's just the degree to which you are fully absorbed and drawn into the work. Because if you're snoozing, all the other impacts can't happen, really. So we have a correlation of 0.34, uh, an effect size of 16% between anticipation and captivation. This is why marketing is so strategic. Because you're setting up anticipation levels, which actually, when you look at <laughs> anticipation against impact, you, you skip captivate, right? You have a 40% correlation, a 0.4 correlation. So a perfect correlation is one, but positive, right? So our indicator of summative impact is a year from now, how much will you remember? How much of an impression will be left? That turned out to be our best indicator of impact overall a year from now. So there's a strong relationship between anticipation and the rest of the episode. That's one of the key takeaways here, right? Captivation is critical. How absorbed were you? Because the relationship between captivation and this indicator of summative impact is 0.7. It's, and, and in a way, Captivation actually is, is an impact, right? I think that, that this is one of the main reasons people go out to arts programs is to just get in that state of consciousness we call flow, where they're fully absorbed, they've let go of everything else in their mind, and they're completely absorbed in, in your art. And just achieving that state of consciousness is, in and of itself, an impact. And it also allows a lot of other stuff to happen. So on the other side of this, the post-performance engagement stuff that you do, the making meaning afterwards, has a high correlation to summative impact. All right, and this was a question earlier. Right, there's a, there's a strong statistical relationship between post-performance engagement and uh, reporting impacts, overall impact. So both on the front end, and on the back end, what we didn't really ask about was the, you know, all of the engagement stuff that happens during, you know, like super titles, broadcasting to mo mobile, mobile apps that you might look at during. There's, there's a wonderful controversy we won't get into around that. <laughs> um, fortunately, there's a strong positive relationship between summative impact and loyalty. Uh, uh, measured... Um, by uh, likelihood of recommending this theater to a friend. So people who report higher impacts are more likely to recommend your theater. To report loyalty, 
which is great, but what, where it sort of all breaks down is, is, is I can't say that higher loyalty actually leads to repeat attendance because we have all these infrequent people reporting high impacts who don't come back as frequently as we'd like them to. So I just challenge you to think, you know, what can we offer in addition to an excellent artistic experience that will encourage people to come back? The social atmosphere, you know, really what uh, additional value uh, can we offer people and how can we collaborate across the ecosystem to encourage people to just take in more theater or art in general? Um, let's just take a few minutes for any uh, questions before we break. Yes? Um, I was thinking about this, and this may be the case in point, um, where, you know, you're talking about the um, people talking about the show on the way home, and mm -hmm. I've heard somebody who said she talked about a play for weeks, versus the actual talk back opportunity. I think maybe sometimes the questions come up, you know, after you've sort of digested it for a little while. And that might be a little bit why uh -huh. people don't necessarily come to the talk back, but instead those unanswered questions come later. Uh -huh. Yeah. One of the things we're, we are wondering about is when the optimal time is to do this type of surveying, um, because we don't quite know when, when impact sets in. Um, the other thing to say is that the talk back percentage is very a lot. So there are companies that had up to 40% of their audience attending their talk backs. And the format of those talkbacks also varied a lot. Um, so, you know, there's, there's everything from the, the artist as expert sitting on stage and taking very personal questions from the audience about their own experience, and then there's something as, as dramatic as kind of um, story circle style conversations that are happening where people are relating how they are personally impacted by the work. And um, there's an interview in the book uh, with Dudley Koch, who is the artistic director of Roadside Theatre in Virginia, and who pioneered this thing called Story Circles. And, and he talks a lot about Story Circles and Talkbacks as, as kind of um, a really important part of the, the mission of any piece of art, um, is to kind of ask people to engage with that art very personally by, by bringing that art inside them and then talking about what it brings out in them. Um, and, it, you know, I don't know what the actual data says, but the, the artistic directors that we spoke to certainly believe that that type of interaction is proving to be more useful as an audience engagement tool than authoritarian, or authoritative, I guess not authoritarian, that's a different <laughs> um, but authoritative expert talking to novice and answering the novice's questions. Given that right now the research shows or looks like that the people who are getting the most artistically out of the performances are not people that are coming back consistently, has there been a larger sort of amongst the people that you've been talking to a question about whether or not to start moving away from the whole idea of looking at company-based audiences into specifically a show content-based audience and to start switching like models literally from the idea that, oh, our company has an audience to the shows that we specifically do about this, this, and this, has one audience and this, this, and this, and that's how we should be thinking entirely? Um, that's a really interesting question about a shift in thinking away from company-based audiences to show specific. And um, I've just been doing some research for the San Francisco Symphony into musical tastes, construction of musical tastes, and there's a, a wonderful kind of new construct um, in the research literature called taste communities, uh, which is used in reference to social media, um, particularly pe uh, young people identifying with a popular artist like Lady Gaga uh, and the sort of overnight form formation of taste communities which I think is actually different than just liking someone or saying you're a fan. I think it's, there's a social dimension to it. But in, in classical music and perhaps in theater, we need to think more in terms of taste communities, not racially defined, 
not defined by age, but by tastes, really. Uh, and that this might be another way to think about your community and your audience instead of just classifying them in terms of the package they bought. I think also that there's, um, there are certain theaters that are, that are already doing that. I mean, I think flex subscriptions in a way are kind of a first small step towards something like that. But the, one of the things that's really interesting in the artistic director interviews that we conducted in conjunction this, with this work is that depending on the artistic director, there is a very strong, I mean, it seems that every artistic director makes the decision about whether their organization is trying to get people to buy the organization or trying to get people to buy the show. And that, that there's a fundamentally different way of programming a season if you're trying to, if you're really trying to talk to people in, in, in terms of shows. So Jack Ruler at Mixed Blood Theater in Minneapolis, they have, their mission is very strongly about speaking to the people who don't normally come to theater. And so for each show that they do, they build an entirely new audience for that show, and they take it as a point of pride that, you know, they had 12 people overlap from one show to another. Now, as a marketing person, that makes me panicky. But apparently for them, that, that is a real point of pride, that they were able to so diversify the work that they were doing and so effectively go after the people that were supposed to see it, in quotes, that they... Um, that they were able to create those two separate audiences. So it is already happening. It's, it's a big conversation, and it's an artistic conversation as much as it's a marketing conversation. Well, uh, okay, we'll take one more question, and then we really should break, because we're a little bit behind. So you two can duke it out, and one of you can ask us a question. Um, Are you going to talk about advocacy, the role of this stuff in advocacy later? Yeah, we're going to talk a bit about advocacy later. So go ahead. A, it's a great question. The question was about um, where discounted tickets fit into the kind of subscriber versus single ticket buyer scheme. Um, I have, I mean, we've done some research in San Francisco on uh, the differences between patrons who buy half price and the difference and patrons who buy full price. Um, half price people tend to be people who are trying things out for the first time with the company, um, at least according to our research. I also, one of the things that the graph for subscribers versus single ticket buyers really says to me is that we might need to change our idea of what loyalty means and what frequency means. Mm -hmm. um, I know that anecdotally, especially in San Francisco, there are people who attend every single show that a company's putting on, but they buy all of their tickets through Gold Star. And, and whether that's good or bad, those people consider themselves to be incredibly loyal to that company. They expect to be treated as a loyal member of that company. They're willing to recommend that company in the same way that someone who subscribed is, except that, and in some ways, they think they have subscribed. They've just subscribed through Gold Star, which makes a lot of people insane. <laughs> but it also means that you can't, no longer are we in a universe where you can simply put the half-price people at the back of the house. Because those people are as, as important as tastemakers and as word of mouth kind of representatives as the people who've been coming for 20 years and paying you the subscription fees. Okay, let's take a 10 minute break and then we'll come back. Thank you so much.
there's a really cohesive season that so receptive and she's been so gracious in receiving
have a question. Mm -hmm. So the uh -huh. uh -huh. survey is the CPT. Uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. If you email me, then I can yeah. just yeah. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, yeah. Yes. Well, we encourage the, the theaters selected the performances that they surveyed, and we just encourage them um, yeah. to make, to make that cross-sectional performance like the dog here. Okay, I can that. Okay. Yeah, just Generally, we advise and, um, people to stay away from previews yeah. because they it's kind a very of draw a very cinematic audience. But if they do matinees, we encourage them to you know throw in a matinee because often you know how different the audience can be. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, of course. Hello. Hi. Uh huh. Yeah. It's 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 hard to say. This you know study really wasn't really about demographics or who comes on. You know, it's just a blend. Yeah. Need a minute. Yeah. Oh, well, some of these theaters actually well, survey the entire Andrew's audience for the entire ride. Yeah. 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 In, in, small, in the small venues, in the small venues, in the big venues, some of them only surveyed three or four performances during the four week run. So it totally varied, you know, by size and venue. But for the smaller venues, I mean, you should ask um, Carol at the Metro stage who's just about to speak. She has a tiny little venue. Do you know? And, they, and she got a great response. So. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming. <laughs>
So this is a demonstration of um, the online tool that we created to um, essentially make this information more accessible and make more people be able to use the information um, and afford to do this research. Um, and, and so Alan is going to start by walking you very briefly through kind of how, how to get into the dashboard if, say, you were a company who um, had set up this work. And then we're going to talk to each of our three representatives from each of our three companies um, about the results that they've had. So I want to introduce them quickly. So this is Chad Bowman, who hopefully you all know. He's the director of communications, right, here at Arena Stage until tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Carolyn Griffin, who is the artistic director of Metro Stage. Um, and this is Jeff Herman, who's the managing director at Woolly Mammoth. So thank them all for coming. Please give them a round of applause before we start. Thank you very much. They all really, they and their staffs have worked incredibly hard to gather this data, and so um, it's wonderful to see them engaging with it and, and finding useful tidbits to pull out of it. So here's Alan. Great. Very quick tour. Um, uh, we created a website called intrinsicimpact.org where you can go to get a range of information about impact assessment. There's a button called References. If you click on that button, you'll get a little bibliography of studies, of, uh, impact assessment studies around the world. And the top item uh, is downloading this study, uh, which is the same thing that's in the book, except it has the append appendices, which includes the survey protocol, the actual questions. So if you want to see the questions, download that report, and you're, that's where you'll find it, under the references section in the intrinsic impact. So the theaters, you see the red button up at the upper right, it says client login. Clicked on that, and this is what they see. Um, Jeff, we're using your dashboard here. For demonstration purposes, there's seven buttons to press corresponding to sort of different sections of the survey protocol. Um, if you scroll down on that home page, you just see the data that's in your dashboard in terms of what productions, and of course here you can see the staff. You know, the staff results are loaded in the dashboard right along with the audience results. Um, 
And, and then if you click on any of the buttons, you get a drop, couple of drop-down menus. Um, first, just which shows do you want to display? And uh, you can click those on or off, or choose all of them. Um, you can choose to filter your results uh, by any of a number of demographic or other filters. It's just cr like cross-tabs, ticket type, decision role, age, gender, uh, and um, we've got a couple of, you know, whether or not someone did anything to prepare, uh, their captivation, uh, how, how, how much they were captivated, a lot, a little. Um, and we can customize that for you, uh, all right? And there's also another drop-down where you can choose to display all of the results by show or in aggregate. So if you want to look at all of your shows, you can uh, aggregate them that way. So this is just simple results, percent, uh, who, uh, Willie Mammoth said they did anything to prepare. Here's your three productions, uh, Oedipus, El Rey, uh, Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, and Booty Candy, and you see pretty consistent results. When you apply a filter to that through the dashboard, by ticket type, you get figures for subscribers, single ticket buyers, and other types of buyers. That would be comps and groups, and it's typically very small numbers, so the N is small, so you're gonna wanna ignore that and just look at subscribers and single ticket buyers across the three productions. And just that just demonstrates that the whole purpose of the dashboard is to allow the theater to interrogate their results, ask questions of the data, choose filters, choose shows, and actually get your questions answered about your own data. All right, um, with that very brief um, introduction, uh, let's move on to our panels, and our first panelist is uh, Jeff from Woolly Mammoth. Um, and Jeff, could you give us a little background on your three productions? Uh, sure. Hi, everyone. Um, so the three productions that we had surveyed uh, were part of our 2010-2011 season last year. Uh, it was Oedipus El Rey, uh, The Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, and Booty Candy. These were three productions right after one another uh, that started in the, the winter of 2011. Um, Oedipus El Rey uh, was uh, part of a uh, rolling world premiere through our friends at NNPN, uh, written by Luis Alfaro. Uh, ours was the third of three productions of that show, uh, and it was a retelling of, um, of uh, Oedipus uh, told through the lens of um, an Hispanic culture. Uh, it was set in a barrio in Los Angeles in, in modern day uh, and in a prison. Um, the Agony and Ecstasy of Steve Jobs, for anyone who doesn't already know. Um, <laughs> this is uh, Mike Daisy's uh, show about uh, a trip he took to China uh, to, uh, to explore uh, sort of labor practices in the factories where all of our Apple products are made. And uh, that trip was sort of intertwined with uh, his telling of Steve Jobs' history and, and Mike's own history as sort of an Apple fanboy. Uh, and then the final production, Booty Candy, uh, was a new play by Robert O'Hara, um, an African-American playwright. Uh, who we've worked with uh, a couple of times in the past. Uh, and this was a, sort of a semi-autobiographical piece uh, about uh, growing up um, uh, gay and black. Uh, it was a series of sort of short comic sketches that I would say had sort of a loose sort of connective thread. Uh, and I, took, I think took some chances in terms of its presentational profile, which is I think why we saw uh, such a high measure in terms of sort of the aesthetics uh, of that particular show. So, I mean, what, what was great is I think these were three very wide-ranging shows in terms of audience and style and type, uh, and I think really reflected um, the kind of work that we do at Woolly very well. Great. So let's take a look at a couple of your graphs, and I apologize, you're going to have to crane a yeah, little. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so this is, um, this was looking at your three shows, and it's split up by age cohort. The question is, after the performance, did you email or speak with a friend about the performance? after you got home. Um, it's always interesting to see the variations here. Um, it's not surprising, of course, to see that as people get older, they are less likely to do this activity. Um, I wanted to particularly point out um, the, the higher numbers for Steve Jobs, uh, which is, again, not terribly surprising, but yeah. interesting. And, and also to point out that for Booty Candy, um, admittedly with a fairly small group of 65 plus people, but they, um, they actually emailed and, and spoke with a friend at a higher rate. Now, um, in, in the book, Howard tells the story about how um, Robert wanted to try and reach out to African American churchgoers as part of this play about African American gay culture. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if that's related at all. I find that fascinating, and I think it explains a lot of what happened in that word cloud. Yeah. Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk both about kind of the experience of Steve Jobs and whether you 
you made extra efforts as a staff to encourage this type of communication in that show, and also with Booty Candy, if there's any indicator there. Yeah, Booty Candy, is a, that's, a, that's a real mystery for me. Either people are totally puzzled, or like they are, you know, the older folks are really excited about it. <laughs> it it's hard to know. Um, you know, in terms of Steve Jobs, uh, you know, I think, um, I think Mike created the piece with the intent of trying to get people to act. I mean, this is very much his intention behind, behind creating the piece. And, um, uh, and as folks were leaving uh, the, uh, the theater after the show, um, you know, we had a piece of paper that we were putting in people's hands to sort of say, this is how you can act, this is how you can take action, this is how you can get feedback to Apple. So, so the show itself was constructed as a call to arms, and so, which I think is reflected there in, in the data. Great, great. Um, this next one uh, is, is the three shows again, also split up by age cohort. After the performance, did you reflect privately on the meaning of the work? And one of the findings of this, this research that's been so interesting is that younger people seem to have more of a need to reflect privately, and you can see that here. Um, I, I'm wondering, and maybe this goes to um, some of the kind of booty candy confusion and, and audience uh, structure, there's a more precipitous decline with Booty Candy than with the other two shows. Um, you, Willie Mammoth, historically has a very young audience. Mm -hmm. um, is that to say that, I mean, do you want to kind of hypothesize a little bit about Yeah, you know, I, I think the, the feedback that we were hearing uh, uh, from audiences from Booty Candy, I think definitely skewed with regard to how old you were. Um, and it was sort of, um, it was sort of a chopped up um, narrative. Uh, you know, not exactly in a straight line, but kind of wove this way and that, more like Saturday Night Live in a way. Um, and I think that um, we were hearing confusion from older audiences about that and excitement from our younger audiences about that. Um, you know, which, which in a way makes me think, well, maybe this actually should be shifted. Like, if that's the case, then older folks, maybe they should have been reflecting more about it. Um, or, but maybe what this is telling us is that the aesthetics of the piece sort of um, turned off a switch for them. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it, it's, it's interesting, and it is interesting how sort of steeply it declines. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, do you have, so we're gonna talk more later after we talk to the other two here, but do you have any other kind of general comments about your experience of doing this work as a theater company? Uh, you know, I, um, there's so much data, and it's so rich, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface. I think, um, you know, I was kind of flipping through it uh, the last couple of days just to kind of prepare for all of this. I think the thing that struck me the most um, was sort of comparing um, the staff's response to each of the criteria with what we were actually hearing from the audience. And I was, I was shocked to hear that we, I think we really underestimated um, our audiences in many ways. I was really shocked to see that. Um, I just kind of jotted down a couple of things. I mean, we really underestimated um, how much audiences were, would be thinking about the structure of the shows, which is something that, that's always a concern for us, especially with more experimental work like Booty Candy. We underestimated sort of the emotional response that people were going to have to the work. Um, and we overestimated how much discomfort people were going to have, um, how connected they were going to feel to characters, um, their social bonding, how many questions they were going to have. So it really, I think it really prompted some self-reflection on how well do we really know our audiences. And actually maybe they are, maybe they are hungry for stuff that's even further out on the limb than, than maybe we had, we had thought they were. You know, that, that is... It's very interesting to hear that has been the experience of some other companies really? kind of in your vein throughout the country. Um, that there's a, it's, I, I don't, it's not necessarily an underestimation as much as it's just um, hedging a little, I think. Um, there's one company in, in San Jose that participated where um, the, the staff really expected people to be offended by some of the shows that they did. And there's a question that you can ask, were you offended by anything you saw? And kind of, their, their measurement of stretching people is whether they've offended a certain percentage of their audience with any given show. Um, and, and they didn't. They yeah. didn't. And, even, and, even, and what was more amazing is that it was their oldest patrons that were the least offended. Right. Right? They've been jaded, they've been through yeah, everything. Yeah, yeah. But negative people on stage, who cares? Um, and so I think that that's a larger conversation to have is, is there, if your goal is stretching, and if your goal is really moving people to a place that they're uncomfortable going, um, really how far do you have to go, and also why, why do you have to do that? Like what is it about what's going on that's making people less reactive to that stuff? Yeah. Great. Yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay, well let's move on to Carolyn. So Carolyn, um, can you tell us a little bit about Metro Stage and the three productions that you did? Sure, thank you. Um, many of you probably know Metro Stage. We're out in um, Alexandria, so we are not, it's 
It's so interesting to me that there are so many different professional theaters and they all have such different aesthetics and different missions and different audiences and we share some of our audiences and some of them we don't. For Metro Stage, we're in a sub suburban area, close in but suburban, and that does have to inform a little bit of how we choose a season. Um, we started with this um, round with, with these um, surveys, we started with our holiday show, Broadway Christmas Carol. Well, because we were doing Broadway Christmas Carol, because it's a, it's a spoof on Charles Dickens' Christmas Carol and using Broadway show tunes as parodies. And we've done very successful work with another musical, 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 the musical that parodies Broadway composers. And so why not bring back Broadway parodies? Because people love Broadway parodies, well, they love this. And now we've done it two years in a row and we'll continue. But the point is that rather than really looking for a, something thematic that is the umbrella over, but we, which we have done in certain years, now where it's more, we know what audience is like. We don't have, we have some crossover audiences. We have some that don't cross over, but we know what they like and we bring it to them. So Broadway Christmas Carol being Broadway parodies was one we did followed by our traditional January, February, March, African-American musical. Um, His Eyes on the Sparrow it, um, was about Ethel Waters. It was a one-woman show with I think maybe just a piano. And um, very popular. We have a very big following for this time of year, for this these musicals. We've done everything from Mahalia to Alberta Hunter to uh, many, many, many. Just finished Josephine Baker. Um, Ethel Waters, very popular, but there were times when, you know, our, and, and oftentimes an audience would be 98% African American. Um, so we, we served that population during that period of time in our um, season with those, sh those shows. Um, followed by The Real Inspector Hound, the, the spoof on Agatha Christie. Um, by Tom Stoppard. The reason we chose that this year, that, that, that year, is that we had done the year before Tom Stoppard, very different type of show. He had adapted a, play, a French play called um, Heroes, with, and it had three really renowned actors here from Washington. It was a brilliant, beautiful piece, was really recognized critically, and people are still talking about it. It had tremendous emotional resonance. This show we brought back, because we brought to Metro Stage for, as part of our season because we had roles for those same three actors plus others. The terrific cast, many Wooly companies numbers, and so we brought that back. It's a curious piece because it's it did it didn't have the emotional resonance that people might have come expecting because they'd seen Heroes the year before, and it just doesn't have the intellectual element at, that one comes to expect from Stompard. So it's a little bit of an anomaly, and I think the results that we will see will support that. Right, right. Well, so the, the first result here, so this is um, the three shows split out by ticket type, um, and likelihood to recommend future Metro Stage programs. Um, you overall have incredibly good numbers for people, and I know, Carolyn, that this was something that you took pride in when we had our initial meeting over a year ago, um, uh, just kind of your pride in your audience and their loyalty to you is, um, is well-founded, it turns out. I was interested to see here um, the, the kind of variations between your single ticket buyers and your subscribers. Again, it, it's not terribly subscribe, uh, surprising, but um, you know, what you just referenced about Real Inspector Hound is interesting here. If you take a look at your, your single ticket buyer numbers there and, and kind of the shift uh, down in the percentage of people who were extremely likely or very likely to recommend. I'm wondering, not trying to, you know, ask you anything very specific about the show, but can you talk about, kind of generally speaking, people's reactions? I know you stand at the door after most performances and talk to people, so why do you, why do you think there was that shift away, or, or to a slightly lower percentage of people who were highly likely to recommend the work? I, th I think with Real Inspector Hound, as clever and, and wonderful production of the piece, people left kind of confused. They weren't really sure who murdered the guy. You know, it, it, you know and that, they, and, well, I'm still a little confused. So, so it, it just, it was not as satisfying. It, you know, 
I guess the, the satisfaction would be for the real Stoppard fan, for the really sophisticated theater goer who understood that there were all kinds of crazy, crazy things, at kind of, you know, we had the two critics on the stage watching the play that we were watching from the other side, and it all could have been just, and then it would stop in the middle and they'd be talking. It, it was very Stoppard, very, very clever, but for maybe your average theater goer, a little too clever. Do you, do you feel like that, um, that had you known this amount of response was going to happen, is there anything you could have done differently to prepare people? You talked about a lot of people came in thinking this was going to be Heroes, and Heroes is an incredibly emotional, kind of it's, it's kind of invention of love style stoppered as opposed to this style stoppered. So can you, do you, is there a variation in, in kind of pre-engagement stuff that you might have done differently, or not really? I, I don't know, because I think the pre-engagement stuff is so vital and so important that it's come out of all of this. I don't know for this particular show, my inclination is, should have done a different show. Um, you, you know, I mean, I just don't know how much you can prepare people for the abstract nature and the curious nature of the way Stoppard um, structured this piece and as really as extraordinary. It's still fabulous wordplay and fabulous stoppered, but I just don't think it's to everybody's taste. And maybe it's to every, uh, people's taste who aren't coming to Metro stage. But to, in, to reference heroes, a lot of the things we do, I think, are chosen because this is what I'm attracted to, are things with really, really incredible emotional resonance resonance like a hero's even the ethel waters piece these these pieces these you know critics may not always like bio musicals but you know there's some stories that are really really important to be told and some amazing people to be told about and they do have incredible emotional resonance and real inspector hound didn't right well and and actually the the emotional resonance i i imagine that that's a factor here so this is um looking at the three shows across ticket type again. And if you look there, you've got this great bump for Sparrow. Um, and, and I know that you were specifically interested in getting a different set of audience members, in this case African American, to come see that show, that it was a different type of show. Um, I, I, those, the, the amount of people who reflected privately on the work having jumped so much there, um, I'm wondering if you have, and, and also, um, you've got a very large number of single ticket buyers in relation to your subscribers. Is that, um, what, what, what is your subscription like and, and what, is, what was the difference in the audiences that you think might have encouraged this response? Well, we have a very small subscription base to begin with. With our, our musicals, our winter musicals, we get buy, house buyouts, we get groups. It's a very significant jump in they're single ticket buyers, but many, many, many of those single ticket buyers are actually coming as groups, but they are not subscribers. So the single ticket buyer for a real inspector hound is very different from the si single ticket buyer for Sparrow. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so we're going to move on to Chad, but do you have any last bits, and then we'll come back to you to kind of talk about more general feelings about the work? Well, I, I guess I, all I can say right now is that this, this is so fascinating and, and for, for a theater like Metro Stage, which is so small and so understaffed, this is so inspiring to me to see this kind of, these results because it really does tell me what I need to be doing in the future. And I think when you read the, the, um, the essays by the other artistic directors, you'll see some really interesting continuing themes across all artistic directors, and um, I think this data, maybe we can be more specific later, very, tells me exactly what I need to be doing next. Hmm. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Um, Chan, um, could you give us, um, you know, we covered a little of this already, just a little background on your three uh, <coughs> pieces. Uh, sure, when we were actually asked to uh, select plays for, for uh, this survey, uh, we were opening this, this building in the, same, in the same season. And immediately I thought, well, we can't do the first two shows because I'm still going to be trying to figure out how this building operates. 
Um, but we try to look over uh, a scope of what it is that we do. I mean, we have several pillars. Um, we have a presentation pillar, we have a production pillar. Uh, we do musicals, we do non-musicals, we do world premieres, we do non-world premieres. And in these three specific shows, we tried to capture all of that. In hindsight, um, I know in the past couple of weeks, there's been a lot of discussion about the roles musicals play in the theater community, and I wish we would have put Oklahoma in, mm -hmm. uh, but we didn't. Mm -hmm. um, so, on these three shows, Let Me Down Easy is Anna DeVere Smith's uh, show about healthcare. Um, it started in uh, uh, second stage. Uh, this was our first uh, entry into actually launching a national tour, so we knew that we were going to be um, basically presenting work from second stage, but then sending it out into the world. Uh, we knew that it had a very strong um, socio-political message, uh, similar to probably uh, what Mike Daisy was trying to do. Um, but this was a pretty much a presentation, and it was in a, uh, again, we have three separate spaces. This was in our proscenium space, so we, I actually wanted to look in what happens and in, in impacts between our three theaters as well. Uh, the second production, uh, there was a tour of Ruined going on, and I believe that the Berkeley Rep production was the tour. Um, our production wasn't the tour because we, we uh, chose to set it in the round, and because there's only maybe five theaters in the world that are in the round, I know that's a um, an understatement, but there's very few in the round spaces. It wasn't a tour; it was, our, it was a production, um, and it uh, it involves again a socio-political message uh, uh, about um, some themes that are in the Congo, um, and it, uh, it it came to us from a very good New York pedigree, and Lynn Nottage's work is is very well known. So it was one of these senses that we were doing our own work, but again, it came to us with with a pedigree. Uh, the third and final production was, was one of these things that it was a world premiere. It was in the Krieger. Um, it was the first time uh, John Grisham's novel had been adapted, um, but it was a theatrical adaptation. Um, we knew at the time that there, we didn't exactly know what we were going to get because the story is very powerful, um, but again, it was part of uh, a, a greater uh, well-known work. Um, and so I wanted to throw something in about, uh, specifically since we were asking staff what we think was going to happen versus what actually happened with our audiences on new work, that span can be pretty significant because while you're creating new work, you never know what you're going to get. And so uh, that's why we threw that in. Great. Um, so first thing, um, motivations. Uh, and we looked at some motivations earlier. Uh, but these were the motivations reported by your ticket buyers for the three productions. There were really some interesting differences, okay? So to discover something new was much higher for Ruined, right? Um, uh, to revisit a familiar work or artist was, three, uh, was twice as high for uh, a time to kill, right? Uh, so presumably people were familiar with the source work. To see the work of a specific actor, director, or artist was highest, obviously, for Anna DeVere Smith. Uh, and then to be emotionally moved actually was, was significantly higher for Ruin as, an, as, an, as, an, as a motivation for going. You know, now, we are asking about this afterwards. Mm -hmm. So it's an interesting idea, you know, even though we're asking people retrospectively about their motivations going in, you know, if there's some coloration of this, as a result of having seen the work already. Um, so I guess the question to you is, um, motivation, oh, there's one more to relax, or as escape, actually, you know, lest we forget, uh, was highest for a time to kill. Um, if, if this, you know, as the marketer, you know, if you were thinking about kind of the very different complexion of these works in terms of motivation. Yeah, and I'll respond from my personal belief here, because there's a lot of discussion in, in the blogosphere world about mission-based work. Um, I actually think that large regional theaters have a responsibility to present a balanced meal approach. Um, there, are, there are people that want escapism. There are people that want to be challenged. There are people that want to be um, the various uh, motivations that you covered. Uh, to me, from a marketing perspective, I'm really happy with these numbers. Why? Because we presented a really balanced approach. Of course, people uh, that are coming to ruin are going to become, they want to see something new. They want it to be emotionally challenged. Uh, people that are coming for uh, Let Me Down Easy wanted to hear more about probably healthcare. They wanted, but they also came because they were interested in Aunt Beer Smith's work. Um, it's no surprise to me that A Time to Kill, people wanted to come and relax and escape. Why? It's a best-selling novel. 
Um, so to me, this this is a strength of, of the company. Mm -hmm. And did your marketing materials, either consciously or not, reflect these motivations, do you feel? Yeah, I think um, you, you made a really good point earlier in the, in the day about how, as marketers, we set up specific expectations. In fact, uh, I was talking yesterday to, uh, to Peter at the Washington Post about how you can do a musical, but if you're doing a musical and Peter Sellers is directing it, it's a completely different thing. And so my job is to set up expectations. And so here, we, we pretty much guessed well on what these were going to be, and the way we marketed those shows were marketed to those specific motivations. Um, that said, we don't always do that perfectly, um, particularly with new work, because it's, it's hard, it's evolving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, did you do anything to prepare? Um, about a third of Let Me Down Easy patrons said they had prepared in advance, which was really quite a bit higher than the uh, uh, patrons for Time to Kill. Um, we asked, you asked people, what did you do to prepare? Uh, and th these are some uh, examples. <laughs> um, how does your patron's reliance on criticism in the post affect your communication strategy? Nelson, you can't watch this. <laughs> oh, sorry, do we have the critic with us? Yeah, we have it. We have several oh, critics, actually, now. Okay. Um, <laughs> intensive. <laughs> Good job. I'm, I'm sorry, I was... I was no, 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 you, can, you can take a pass on this if you like. But, I mean, criticism, as you know, is a, big, is a big issue in the theater field, particularly in markets where there is none. And, you know, our research on audience shows there's a segment of ticket buyers who basically won't go unless they read something saying, you can't miss this production. Yeah. And it's a big challenge in the field. And generally, you don't have that problem here. You have high quality criticism. And actually, um, it, it, um, it really came through in your data as a form of preparation. I mean, I, I think the best theater cities in the world are actually uh, si significantly supported by the best criticism in the world. Um, I think uh, the, the DC metro area has phenomenal criticism. I think New York has phenomenal criticism. I, I, I uh, read Chris Jones's work in Chicago and I read Frank Rich's work in Hartford. I've never been to Hartford, but I read Frank's work. Um, so, uh, you know, theaters love criticism when they're stroking you, and theaters hate criticism when they're criticizing you. That's just the nature of the business. But God bless the fact that people are writing about us. Um, and this does not surprise me at all, um, particularly as, as you know, well, what did surprise me is that the 44 plus contingent read reviews and the 44 uh, and younger contingent pretty much didn't. I mean, that, that in itself is not surprising, but it means that we're serving two uh, separate distinct groups. And there is one group that we're going to get with uh, probably professional criticism. There's another group that we're going to get. Um, with word of mouth strategies and probably what I consider pro am criticism, which is like Yelp sites. Yeah, yeah. So just just to promote the the book a little bit, we did ask at the last minute. We included a question on the survey about did you read a review by a professional critic or a preview? Because there was a hypothesis that people who'd read a bad review were going to report lower impacts. And conversely, people who read a positive review, but we didn't code in our data whether the review was positive or negative. Um, but there is information in the book about the relationship between having read a review or preview and the effect on anticipation. So I'll just encourage you. All right, Chad, one last thing. Uh, staff results versus audience results for um, uh, did anything about the performance offend you or make you uncomfortable? And what you see here is the staff generally, and this is 20 some people, for every one of your productions anticipated a lot more people would be offended than were by a point or more, honestly, on average. And I guess the really, the, the question here is kind of are your audiences more resilient to challenging content than you think they are? Uh, well, obviously. I, mean, <laughs> <laughs> I think it. I think it goes to to uh, to Jeff's point. I think um, 
You know, and this is something that, that uh, marketing folks have to be aware of. I think that we think that our audiences scare more than they actually do. Um, and uh, it, it, it can lead to cautious marketing. Um, when in fact, actually, I think some of the things that our audiences are looking for are things that we're trying to steer away from in messaging. Um, because, uh, because they could be looking for these things. They're looking to be challenged but yet we're scared of challenging them in some senses because it could turn away a ticket buyer. Um, but for those people that are looking for that, then you've turned them away by not messaging to them. Right. So, it, it, and actually this was pretty common throughout. I remember us thinking in our data that, that uh, part of what marketing people do is guess on a reaction of their, their uh, communities. Uh, what this shows is I'm really bad at that. And not only am I really bad right. at that, our entire staff well, is bad at that. Or that you're just, sensitive to the people who complain yeah. <laughs> and that's not necessarily representative of the total audience. Can, um, can I ask a question? Yes. Because uh, I'm a little bit uh, confused by one aspect of this. Uh -huh. um, isn't offense almost like a pre-selected quality as to whether you see a show or not? Like if, uh, if a show is effectively marketed and I know that I'm probably not going to like it, or it's going to piss me off, I'm not going to pay money to see it. Uh -huh. So isn't this a little bit skewed like in terms of people who already have elected to see the show by and large are going to be willing to go along with the content? Sure, so, so, so is there self-selection going on before? Yes, yeah, so like I'm wondering uh -huh. how much of that skews the actual numbers of... Um, yeah. That's a good question. This is like based on potential audience versus real yeah. audience. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think yeah. obviously there is some self-selection going on. And, and honestly, to be perfectly candid with you, this question is problematic because people can be offended at the injustices represented in the play of uh, women, injustices against uh, labor, you know, or people can be offended at nudity or offended at vulgar language. There's very different things to be offended. One, you know, very different things. And we blended them together here. And in, in the future, I think we can't, we can't do that. Um, so we learn. All right. Um, I'd like to kind of open this up a little bit now um, and have a, just a, uh, maybe 10 minutes of conversation. Uh, with you all and the panelists here about kind of taking stock of this work. And I, I put together just a few questions here, ask you to reflect on this. Um, uh, the first one is about qualitative versus quantitative data. Um, if, if you, you know, we'll start with you, Jeff, if you have any uh, kind of uh, sense of the value of the qualitative data versus the quantitative data. Yeah, I, um, I did find the qualitative data much more interesting because all we ever look at is quantitative data. I'm sick of looking at quantitative data. And so this was, it was really some fresh data points for us. Um, and, uh, you know, one of, the, one of the values of Woolly Mammoth is to ignite an explosive engagement between artists and the community. Um, and so uh, sort of the, the way this whole survey was constructed in many ways played into the things that are important in our mission statement that we didn't really have metrics for before. And so that was the stuff I was most fixated on and most interested in, and I think it's told us sort of the most about where we might want to go moving forward. Interesting. Um, other comments? Um, what, what I think, what I found most interesting is how much the qualitative and the quantitative meshed and supported each other. And when you get to the back where you read the art, artistic director um, essays, and the one example I want to give, because it's so supported by the quantitative data that having the anticipation with, um, by having done the research and made the decision and gotten into it a little bit before you even come to the theater, um, that and then the post-show opportunities for discussion, all of which enhance the ultimate impact. All of the, so many of the examples in this book have artistic directors talking about post-show discussions and, and things that really are, are something that 
any theater can incorporate so one of I forget which theater they do a post show discussion after every performance I mean there's something kind of amazing about that kind expanding the experience beyond what they see on the stage and giving people the opportunity to to and deal Caroline, with it. did you do some interviews some you did some interviews didn't you my assistant did so uh -huh. I didn't I don't have direct Okay. Information about that, but what I will say because I think it's this is so relevant for me with the shows I have coming up. I have a show coming up in a week of, about it's a one man show about a, his family escaping Cuba in 1964. So we will definitely have more post show discussions than we've ever programmed for that, and then the show after that is uh, is Lonely Planet, which is a, a classic AIDS play. And we will have we will incorporate some post show discussions, mm -hmm. and we haven't traditionally done that. Mm -hmm. And I this is really inspiration for me and motivation for me to really get it together and do more of that, particularly with the kinds of plays we have coming up the next two shows. So this has been That's the great. timing is perfect, and I can really incorporate what you found, and I'll let That's you know great. how it works. Yeah. Um, any of you, did you get any positive or negative feedback from audience members on the survey? On the actual survey uh -huh. itself? Yeah. The, yeah the, the most interesting thing that I actually I found on, on the, the qualitative feedback that we got on the mm -hmm. survey was we spend a lot of time at Arena Stage trying to prep audiences. We do, you know, blogs and videos and we have this great uh, virtual dramaturg thing where we write a whole bunch of articles and it's a, it's a lot of time and energy and the, I know that David, our associate director, was really interested in if that was informing people. We actually got feedback from a fair amount of people that said, listen, you could have all of the, the, the best articles and the best preparation and I just don't care. <laughs> and the reason why, and, and I, I didn't think about this, the reason why is that they, this subsection of people want the work to stand on its own completely on its own, and so I, I wanted us to be mindful of that's not a failure for us, right. that, there is, that there is a good subsection of people that want that prep and they want the discussion, they want it, and then there's another subsection that just don't, and you know, this, this weekend I went to Signature Theater in New York and saw the lady from Dubuque, and I left sobbing. Mm -hmm. It was a beautiful production. I wanted to talk about a lot, but when I'm sobbing, I'm not going to talk to anybody, yeah. mm -hmm. and that's perfectly fine. So I thought that was interesting feedback that we uh -huh. got. Jeff, did you have any any feedback from audiences? Um, I'm going to have to defer. Um, Melanie Parker, our connectivity assistant, is here, who is really involved in sort of pulling a lot of the stuff together. Um, and you were sort of nodding your head to me. Yeah. Um, um, I think what was what was interesting in terms of the feedback from the survey is that. Uh, we, we really recognized that, uh, that the survey was super helpful and that we wanted to take some of the questions and extrapolate them and put them into a sort of miniature version of the survey, which we continued and are continuing to gather more data uh, this season. What we found is that the wordsmithing of very specific ways that, that you put together the questions um, when we surveyed in the spring is so important because a lot of folks kind of shut down and responded on our open-ended parts how, you know, I can't even answer this question because I don't really care what it means. I don't care what you're actually asking me, which, which was harmful, but also a good learning moment because we, we needed to recognize, you know, how can we frame these questions for these people who want to reach out and give us the feedback? So how can we, um, how can we get the answers that we're looking for, but also sort of probe these people and allow for them to feel not diminished by answering our questions. That's great. I'll say the one thing that we did that we did not do, that we should have done, we have to deal with in the future is allowing audience members the instant they finish a survey to see some results mm -hmm. and get some context on their own answers. Uh, and really kind of fulfilling the contract. Uh, and so we have to figure out how to do that in a way that um, is both transparent and also doesn't um, disclose too much, too much information. Um, so that's something we're going to work with because, you know, when you, when you articulate your feelings about an artistic work, 
and it just goes into a black hole, you know, at the least we can do, I hope, is in some newsletter or something, thank people and perhaps give them three or four bullet points of something you learned, you know. Because if we're going to keep surveying people over and over again, there has to be accountability. And I think otherwise we'll see the sort of fatigue, the survey fatigue, um, that some of you already are seeing. Any others of you want to address any of these questions? I would like to address. Yes. Okay. Please take the mic. That last question about will impact data ever inform programming choices? I think that's a fascinating question, and having just been reading what artistic directors have written, almost consistently they say we we program, we make choices because these are things we believe we want to present, we need to present, audiences need to see the actual impact of it. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. There was no questioning as to actually the choice, it's just sometimes in anything, in any enterprise, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes people get it, sometimes they don't. But what this does do is tell us how better to prepare, prepare I guess inform is a dangerous word, in, in advance of, because we're looking at how. Anyway, there's a lot we can do, I think, based on this, these results, to really enhance the experience and maybe make those things that only you and the director apparently understand, and the critics didn't, and the audience maybe doesn't, maybe there are things coming from this that suggest things that can be done. So I think it's extremely valuable, but I don't think we're not out there doing surveys of what people want to see, right. and never will. Thank you, that's a great distinction. Um, those of you who are here, are there any of these questions you'd like to speak to? Um, yes. I, I would just like, uh, can you just clarify a little by the, would you ever see intrinsic impact as a donor program? What oh, sure. Would you? Well, I kind of have a theory that <laughs> there's a group of donors who would be very interested and good at providing feedback on a regular basis and might pay or increase their donations if they were engaged in that way. Uh, so that, that, but that's just a theory. Yes? Aside from learning about my heretofore unknown deep love of word charts, uh, <laughs> I thought that that was amazing because I think for me, I'd love to be able to pick a word or two that I want people to leave uh -huh. and have, figure out literally how big that word left an impression, because for me that's the visceral component, uh -huh. rather than the intellectual, uh -huh. and I almost would rather have people leaving our shows with a really visceral feeling, and uh, I know which one or two words I think I almost always want that huh. to be. So here's where we're going with this, and several of us have been chatting about this, is trying to actually uh, uh, allow audience members, right after performance, to walk out in the lobby and on their tel cell phone text the words they're feeling, and have a dynamic word cloud in real time forming as basically crowdsourced emotional map of what people just experienced as a form of audience engagement. And we're just looking for a site or two to test that. Could be really fun. That's cool. Other questions? Yes. I, I would just come back to your donor program uh -huh. idea. <laughs> uh -huh. um, and we might consider the idea that we're already doing that, in a sense. Um, on a certain level, certainly from a, as a development staffer, the people who have the loudest voice in giving you feedback are your board members, who are typically your biggest donors, and your highest level donor programs. And it's a tricky thing to try to promise that, that voice to them in the context of a donor program uh -huh. um, and creating a basically a pay for play scenario. Sure. Um, but it's something that I, I think this context of thinking about.
about these ideas could be really useful when you're talking about right. building donor programs that aren't just based on um, dollar values, but when you start looking at young donors programs or specific right. special interest donor programs, right. you can build some of these right. ideas into that. I think you could just as easily build a cadre of, of, of younger people who I might call citizen critics to as another as another group that would perhaps provide a different perspective than your donors, but I agree there's a slippery slope there uh, that you've so beautifully articulated. Yes. Well, and, and yeah, and, and so the question was basically um, that there's a comment basically that your, your reactions to the theater change over time and can change it from the moment you leave the theater to the next morning, to the next day, to six months from, from now. Um, a lot of the work that Theater Bay Area is trying to, to kind of move this, or at least one of the directions we're moving with Intrinsic Impact is to understand its connection to memory and its connection to the creation of specific types of memories. Um, you know, I believe strongly that, that memory is one of the main underpinnings of future attendance. Remembering pleasurable or impactful experiences is the reason that you go back and do it again. And so um, we are fascinated by that question about the changing perception of a show over time. Um, in this case, we, we asked people to fill out the survey within 24 hours. So some of them filled it out immediately afterwards, some of them filled it out the next day, and honestly, some of them filled it out a week later and we included them anyway. Um, and and it's, we, didn't, we can't tell when they filled it out. So that is absolutely something that we need to get more specific about. Now, I will say that the, um, by shifting to the email-based system, which is what we're doing now, there's the possibility of actually timestamping responses. Now, we can't guarantee that, you know, that person went that night, and so when they respond at 11.30 that night, it's because they just saw the show. There's a high likelihood of that, and it would be fascinating to see the evolution of emotional reaction over the two, two to three days after a show. Um, and that's a great direction to go in. It would also be interesting to see the difference between the response rate on the email stuff, because even though it's quicker in some ways, you also have people who will just forget to do it versus the right. survey in their hands. And well, you know, we, we piloted this, the email we're surveying a little bit. The response rate seems fine, but it, it, as Alan pointed out earlier, it's a, it's a subset of your audience. It's not perfect. That's the trade-off for not having to spend lots and lots of money doing it. Um, and it's also something that, that you can get around to a certain degree by asking people to forward the survey to the people they came with. That decreases the the loyalty bias, or it decreases the, the decision maker bias a little bit. Um, but you're absolutely right, it's a, it's a certain subset of people and it's the people who remember to do it, it's the people who know how to use computers, it's the people who rate their email. There's a lot of caveats, but they exist for all of this type of stuff. We should probably thank these guys. Thank you so much for being on this panel. We are, going to, we are going to jump on to the conclusion because we're coming to the end of our time. Thank you guys. You can go ahead and, and head off stage. Um, and so, Alan, why don't you sure. lead the conversation? Great. Um, and this will be very brief. Really, why engage audiences? Uh, critical feedback. We ask this question a lot. Um, I think the response rate itself says something that there, there are plenty of people who are very happy and perhaps even increasingly ex expect to be able to provide feedback. Um, and we think of feedback as a milestone in the audience engagement cycle. Okay, um, uh, we did some research last year for the San Francisco Foundation and wrote a publication called Making Sense of Audience Engagement, 
which you can download from the home page of my website here. And really just try to look holistically at this whole business of engagement before, afterwards. And the, self, the chart is pretty much self-explanatory, but the, the audience engagement cycle begins with marketing, really. It is, it is contextualization. It is often the only context people have going into a live performance, which is why it's so important. And then there's at some point people make a decision to attend whether they themselves decide or they got invited and then there's this opportunity to contextualize the work before they, before the lights go down. And most of that happens sort of the day before you know, or the hours before or actually the minutes before the lights go down where people are frantically <laughs> paging through their program book trying to get that paragraph synopsis before the lights go down, you know, which is actually a story about keeping the lights up <laughs> a little longer. Um, the exchange itself and, and, and all the things that can be done or might be done of adding layers of interpretive assistance on top of an arts experience. It's very controversial, antithetical for many people. Um, I had a fascinating discussion a few months ago in Toronto with the woman who trains the people who do audio descriptions for the blind. And she was, I was listening and I was saying, really, what training do you give them? And it was, it was really amazing. And it just occurred to me, why do you need to be blind to get an audio description? Uh, there are probably people who would love to have uh, the director whispering in their ear through a headset about what was about to happen <laughs> or why someone moved upstage or downstage or, or some interesting aspect of the production. Sort of like the director's cut on a DVD. It's the inside story. Of course that interferes with the authentic art experience. It's artificially injecting content, but I would argue some people would love that and might even pay extra for it. So there's a rich area here about delivering interpretive assistance, you know, starting with super titles uh, into arts experiences. Then the experience ends and then this whole meaning making process kicks in. And some people, as, as we've talked about today, want to dive in and argue about it. Here's what it meant to me and other people. I love the people at, at post discussions who sit in the back. They're not ready to articulate, verbalize their own feelings, but they really want to hear what other people have to say. And their wheels are spinning, and they're saying, well, that's not what I felt, or that is what I felt, you know. And they're learning. They're just not ready to verbalize it yet. The feedback actually probably often happens right afterwards. It might be moved up but it often happens uh, on a on kind of an ongoing basis. And, and as Clay said, we'd love to do a study, uh, people six months later, a year later, and understand how the impact has been packaged as a memory and what is remembered. Because you all remember arts experiences you had decades ago, as if it were yesterday. And they're still paying impact dividends. They're still transforming your life, and that's the amazing thing. And then that feedback, really, actually is an input into the institution's thinking. And, and as our panelists so articulately said, it's not about asking audiences what they want. It's understanding the impact of your artistic choices, and really gaining the sense of, if I make this artistic choice, it's likely to have this impact if I make a different artistic choice and really becoming curators of impact, not just art. And I think, I think you all do that instinctively already and this is perhaps just uh, articulating it a little more. So I just, that's, re that's really my summary. Um, I just encourage you to think of, of audience feedback as not just taking data from your audience but as an investment in your audience's aesthetic development. Because when people fill out a survey with thoughtful questions, you're validating their opinion, and you're in a way teaching them how to have a reaction.
to a work of art, which in the long run, I believe, is an investment in the audience. So Clay, you want to talk about practical applications? Yeah, so um, one of the things that's come up a lot on this tour, and that actually was a question that came up a little earlier today, is um, data is fantastic, but what do you do with it? And especially when it's something like this, that's talking about something that is essentially kind of ephemeral and very individualized. And so we've been thinking a lot and we've been hearing a lot of anecdotes from people about how they are actually taking small steps um, around their programming, around their pre and post engagement activities, around the way that they're engaging as a staff um, to actually practically apply this information. So the, the most obvious one is to check impact against goals. Um, the, the fact that we started asking staff members to give their, um, their projected results for audience members has been really transformative to this research because it gives people a conversation starter. And um, for example, you can now, um, in the dashboard, you can actually divide it up by departments to see which departments are actually jiving most closely with your audience members. This not as a way of kind of penalizing departments that don't seem to be getting it, but as a way of engaging in a conversation about, so why is it that the development people are really understanding, I mean, some of this can be obvious, but why is it that the development people are really understanding kind of the high-level donor responses? Um, why is it that, you know, this marketing staff is really getting this particular aspect of the audience? Um, the, the other thing, and this is something that has happened because we've now transitioned to this email-based online system, is that the, the impact results are almost immediate. They're available usually within 24 to 48 hours, and soon will be quicker than that as the automatic link between the survey and the database is, is finished. Um, and, you know, these companies that worked so hard distributing these surveys then had to wait two to three months to get their results, and of course at that point, um, they're great as data, but they're not very actionable because the show is over and you've moved on to something else and you don't have a lot of time to spend thinking about how that could have been better. Um, creating targeted pre and post engagement when you have access to results within 24 hours is, is something that is entirely possible. You can create something that addresses the questions that seem to be stifling particular impacts um, and you can also uh, create new pieces afterwards that, for example, are built out of questions that audience members themselves have had. Um, at South Coast Rep, um, they have started doing question trees where they actually put questions up in the audience after the show in the lobby and they encourage people to congregate around them as kind of an informal talk back. There's no expert curation. They simply talk to strangers and kind of address those questions and have conversations about it. Um, the other thing that's interesting and an interesting possibility is this idea of profiling a show. So if you've got a premiere show, you've got a show that's never been done before and you do this work and it's going on to another place, there's a possibility of being able to create an impact profile sheet that passes on to that to the next, next place so that they can know these are the type of questions you're probably going to get, this is the type of impact you're probably going to see. Turns out there's a really high social engagement component in this, so you should really be considering post-show social engagement activities like you know, wine tastings or opportunities to talk. Um, or in the other direction, this is a really intellectually demanding show, so you need to make sure that your dramaturgical materials are top-notch because a lot of people will be using them. Um, also engaging departments and board members, um, we've talked about this a lot, but there is a kind of, in the interviews with artistic directors and also in anecdotal conversations with people throughout this work, um, in a lot of companies there's a kind of fundamental disconnect between marketing staff and artistic staff about um, engagement. And that disconnect is, is more due to the fact that there's just different languages that have been spoken in those two departments for a very long time than it is to do with any particular animosity between them. And so if you can get to a point where you can have some common ground, and I'll tell you it was fascinating building these surveys with all of these companies, because we required an artistic staffer and a marketing staffer to be in the room together, haggling it out over 21 questions out of 60 that would fit on three pages. And when you get into that kind of conversation, you start hearing things like, well, I don't care about that. Well, I do. <laughs> well, that's a conversation starter right there. And if you've got <laughs> results on it, then you can actually engage in a conversation as an organization about the goals, mission, and, and potential outcomes that are unrelated to actual economics. And then finally, reporting to your staff, your board, your, um, your funders, your government officials. Why don't you go ahead and wrap up? Okay, so um, we're going to, so as we're moving on, we're talking about engaging the field at large. This is something we're doing over the course of the next year and over the course of many years. Um, Alan is doing a bunch of different initiatives um, in many different countries, including one with the NEA um, that I'm sure you can ask him about afterwards. But 
in our goal, our goal was to make more people able to have this conversation. And the first thing you have to do when you're doing that is decrease the amount of money it costs. And so we have done that using foundation funds. We created this online dashboard. And the Doris Duke Foundation, which has at this point given four separate grants to support this work, which has just been phenomenal. Their most recent grant included a component to subsidize 30 arts organizations who are interested in doing this work for um, it, it subsidizes it not completely, but it drastically reduces the cost to something even more manageable than the cost we've managed to get it down to anyway. Um, and so if you're interested in that, then please email me at clay at theaterbayarea.org. It doesn't matter if you're a theater or another arts organization, please email me. Um, we, we are kind of the database is open and running and we encourage everyone who wants to to try this out, whether you end up getting the subsidy or not. Um, it's very affordable to most people. So I just wanted to really quickly close by bringing it back to Max. Um, because while all this data is really exciting, at the end of the day, it's kind of heavy. And um, for me, what all of this research has come down to, and this has been two years, and it's been a very surprising and engaging and enlightening journey. I've heard so many amazing stories, but what it all comes down to is the artistic experiences we have over a life. And for me, that started with Max, but somewhere along the way, my artistic experiences moved me from wanting to be a lawyer to wanting to work at an art service organization. And as a director of communications, I never thought that that would mean that I eventually got to do two years of research around the actual impact of, in, of art on individuals over time. But now we've got this amazing resource that has been compiled from some of the best minds in the country. Um, artistic leaders, executive leaders, patrons, researchers, thinkers of all types who are all trying to get at this question of, of how to increase the stickiness of arts experiences that constantly make up a life. And so impact leads to memory, which leads to return, which leads to impact, which leads to memory, which leads to return. And that's the thing you need to remember, is that this isn't esoteric. Increasing the impact of the art you have increases the likelihood that people will come back and it increases the stickiness of the memories, the specialness of the memories that they're having of your artistic experiences. It makes them better advocates, it makes them better attendees, it makes them more likely to come back more often, spend money with you, and you bring it right back around to economics again. And so, we're really proud of this work, and we're really proud of what it can do. We can know more about the power of what we do, we can know more about the ability of art to transform the people who see it, we can prove and improve our impact and make stronger, stickier memories for the people who come see it. We can better explain our relevance to people who doubt our relevance every day. We can bridge ad anecdote and numbers and actually have a conversation where everyone's understanding everything. And we can measure what we've always thought was kind of unmeasurable. And that's why we're really proud you have done this work and that we hope you enjoy this presentation. Thank you. Just so we're aware, it is exactly one o'clock. <laughs>